You are looking live at the Holt Arena in Pocatello, Idaho, where two teams have traveled 2,500 miles for a title. In just five years in the ranks of 1AA, Georgia Southern's Irk Russell has made the Eagles the class of the division. Behind the supernatural talents of quarterback Tracy Ham, Georgia Southern won back-to-back -back national titles in 85 and 86. In 88, they point to another quarterback, sophomore Raymond Gross. Gross directs a potent Eagle offense that's thirsty for a third national title. Jimmy Satterfield is hoping to bring home that school's first ever national title. Last Saturday, he moved the Paladins one step closer with a 38-7 win over Idaho, setting up a rematch that Furman players have been waiting for for three years. In 85, they watched a sure national title snatched away by Tracy Ham's incredible comeback. Tonight, it is they that want the victory ride. and Georgians unite. Tonight, the Georgia Southern Eagles meet the Furman Paladins for the national championship in Division I AA. Hello, everyone. I'm Tim Brando, along with Stan White, welcoming you to our national title game here in Pocatello, Idaho. Well, Stan, in that 85 game, it was 44 to 42. You expect wide open offenses, but not as many points. Well, not as many points, and not because they don't have good offenses, but because they do, but because they have a lot better defenses. In fact, each team gives up 100 yards less defensively per game, a touchdown less defensively per game. In fact, Furman is number one in the country, give them less than 10 points a game. And Georgia Southern, not far behind, 14 points a game they give up. These two offenses are very good. They get it done on the ground, but in diametrically different fashion. A lot different fashions, Timmy. Georgia Southern uses the wide open, flex bone, triple option offense. They have great athletes, outstanding athletes. They'll try to get them in open field situations against the Furman defense. Furman, on the other hand, runs the more traditional mm -hmm. eye formation power offense. A little option of their own thrown in, but they can take heart. Last week, Eastern Kentucky ran that same power offense for 318 yards against the Georgia Southern defense that has been bending but not breaking yet. Two teams that know a great deal about playing for a national title coming right at you. Tonight's game is being brought to you by Bud Light. Everything else is just a life. By Cinemax, the pay TV channel that gives you more movies, more joys. And by Apex Play Action VCR Football, the football game that lets you coach the pros. Russell is a legend in the state of Georgia, and his legend is growing by virtue of Vince Dooley's comments in the Atlanta Constitution yesterday, saying that he would love to have his former defensive coordinator come on as head coach next year of the Georgia Bulldogs. Well, Timmy, we got to talk to Irk a little bit about, about that last night. The telling thing was he didn't deny that he would be interested in the job. He didn't put it to rest, which means, obviously, there's some interest there. If he wasn't, he put it away. That's going to affect his players a little bit. I think they'd like to give mm -hmm. him a little gift a going away gift a third national championship jimmy satterfield there he is once the assistant to dick sheridan whose name has also been mentioned as a probable replacement for vince dooley next year satterfield in his second year and there is glenn Connolly set to kick off back deep carl miller number 24 in white along with ernest thompson The kick taken by Miller up to near the 30-yard line, stopped at the 29. Let's meet the Georgia Southern offense at quarterback Raymond Gross. They love to use him. Joe Ross out of Augusta, Georgia is the fullback. The slot backs are Frank Johnson and Ernest Thompson. The wide receivers, Tony Belser and Ross Worsham. Up front, the center is Dennis Franklin. And he's flanked by offensive guards Brad Bernard and Sean Ganey. And the tackles Smith and Twiggs up front for Georgia Southern. First and 10 from the 29. And they go with Ross. 
Up the middle, he has two yards. And let's meet the Furman defensive deployment. Allen Edwards, he's a freshman starting up front, and he'll be flanked by tackles Brian Pitts and Paul Craven. The defensive ends, Kelly Fletcher and Chris Roper, very active defensive ends. And the linebackers, Jeff Blankenship, he's the star of this defense, Kevin Kendrick, and Julius Dixon and Pat Turner in the corners. The safety, Sexton and Hall for Furman. Second down and nine. That's what they love to do with Gross. Nice run support, though, as Blankenship comes over quickly from that linebacker spot to make the stop at the 34. Uh, Gross has really come on as a runner, Tim. The last two games, 161 yards, 150-some yards. He really runs. You see there, over 1,000 yards, the leading rusher on this team. That looked like a rollout pass, but actually it was a run. They just get an extra blocker in front of him, the back that would be running the football. He's dangerous in that sprint-out action. They run the flex bone, third down and five. Ross gets it again, ahead for two yards, and that's all. That is a patented first three plays for Georgia Southern, but not with the patented usual result. It's a punt formation. Important for Furman defensively to know they can stop this offense. It's scary to look at all these wide receivers. You notice no tight ends in the game. Four wide receivers in effect. It's tough defensively to figure out how to stop the, the, all the options that they have. Terry Harvin to punt. And back deep, you see there, number 31, Pat Turner for Furman. Gets it away at about his 25. Nice punt. Packing Turner up inside the 10. And it's into the end zone. The Furman Paladin offense. Out of that eye formation that they'll run, Frankie DeBusk is their quarterback. You'll have behind him Dwight Sterling and John Bagwell as his running backs. The wide receivers, George Carls and Donald Lipscomb. The tight end is Keith Swilling. They'll use three of them, though. The center is Steve Dugan. He's their best offensive lineman. Adams and Bailey will flank him. And the tackles, Kyle Lowry and B. Cowan. First down, 10, Furman. And they'll operate from their 20-yard line. It's a 62-yard punt, by the way. Just moments ago by Arvin. The bus spread out action. Looking long for Lipscomb. He's there. Terry Young finally hauled him down. But Frankie DeBus with the first big play of the game to Lipscomb the burner. This is the play that they have in specially for this game. They put him in the slot, hope to get him matched up against number 49, Randall Boone. The free safety, they felt Lipson could beat him with his speed. He did right down the middle of the field, way behind the free safety. What a big play to start a national championship game. 48 yards on the first play from scrimmage for Furman. And they go this time with Bagwell piercing inside the 30 down to the 27 yard line. A host of Eagles in on the stop for Georgia Southern led by Everett Sharp, the right side linebacker out of Lyons, Georgia, the 230 pound junior. Jimmy, they're not going to save anything. There's another new play, one they stole from Syracuse, a sprint draw called cutback play with a tackle pulling to the backside to lead it. We'll take a look at it more in depth later. Bagwell, who saw his numbers, he's the guy they like to run outside as well as in. Sterling is the fullback. The bus broken play that time. Giff Smith was there, but there were problems from the outset that time as the bus appeared uh, confused. D. Smith, the outside end, he's really thrived in his new defense. We'll have to talk about that, too. The Eagle 7 has gotten away from the 4-4, the 6-2, the eight-man front that Eric Russell used at Georgia, and he's mm -hmm. used here at Georgia Southern. Made famous the junkyard dog defensive deployment, they once called it. Third down and eight after that loss by the bus. The delay, Bagwell dropped it. Georgia Southern's got it. Karen Alford, who is one of the pair of twins 
of terror. One of the defensive ends came up with it. Eric Russell's a happy man. Well, it started off to look like a good play, Tim. It opened up on the draw play. He has both arms. Right when he's switching, he just loses the football. Nobody caused the fumble. He's using, he's, he did the right thing in switching arms going through the line. But you've got to be able to get it in your other hand without losing control of it. First down, 10 at the ball at the 27-yard line for Georgia Southern. Gross with the option all down in a hurry. Alan Edwards, the freshman, being tested in this game. He's going up against Dennis Franklin, who's an outstanding center for Georgia Southern. Well, he's an All-American center against a freshman nose guard, and uh, anybody that's played the 34 or the 5-2 Oklahoma defense knows if you blow the nose guard out, you can run all day on that type of defense. Second down, 13. You see the time remaining. Just underway first quarter from Pocatello, Idaho. And again, the option snuffed out. This time, Kelly Fletcher. The defensive end on the other side. Best pass rusher on this team. Junior out of Dalton, Georgia. They're making the stop. He's quite a student as well. Academic All-America selection. And this is a situation that they do not like. Third down and long, third and 14. They may just go ahead and run an option here and try to make a big play or the same rollout they used to start the football game because they're not proficient in the passing offense. Third down, 14 now for the Eagles. And here goes Gross. First down and then some out beyond the 40 to the 41-yard line. Julius Dixon, the speedster, made the stop the cornerback for Furman. Here's what Gross does at the very best. And just what we talked about, they don't want to put the ball up. They run the counter option. They bring the slot back around from the backside of Tripp's formation. Nobody's on the quarterback, Gross. You could not leave him run free. Make him give it to the fullback. Make him pitch it. But he's been the big man at offense. Don't let him go free. From the 42, first down. The middle again to Joe Ross, the fullback. Edwards is there again, the nose guard. Hits and Craven by his side. Edwards is starting in place of Wayne Burr, who broke his arm in the second playoff game. So that's one pivotal loss up front. They were very concerned about the freshman, though each time we talked to the coaches, including Bobby Johnson, the defensive coordinator, they were very confident in the youngster. Second and eight. Stabilizing, so very important in this offense. Well, he switched into the right play. Frankie Johnson inside Furman territory for a first down. Kevin Kendrick, the weak side linebacker, made the stop for the Paladins. Well, Jeff Blankenship is an all-American linebacker. You see him filling the inside here, taking the quarterback, making a big hit on Gross, forcing the pitch, but his teammates weren't there to take care of their responsibilities. Around the corner and free yardage for that Georgia Southern offense, another first down. Now, when they get into the opposition's territory, they are dynamite in scoring proficiency, this Georgia Southern team. There you see Johnson's numbers. And up front again, they go to Ross. That's the play, though, that the Furman defense felt they had to stop because if they can't stop this base play, the first option, then they have no chance against the Georgia Southern team. Well, the fullback can hit you quick. They can run the track that they just run, or they can run the base option handoff play. Both of them can be devastating if you let them get through the line of scrimmage. Tim, the play before, we saw the audible. That's where an option team wants to be, in the middle of the field, because you can't overload it defensively. You can go to the man short. Blankenship, the Southern Conference Defensive Player of the Year, great linebacker. And here again, the option gross inside the 40. For the 38, Chris Roper, the defensive end, number 88, junior out of West Columbia, South Carolina, making the stop for the Paladin defense. Defensively, you love to have him on a hash because you can use that sideline right there. They use the sideline as a 12th man, which evens out. You put six on one side, five into the boundary, and use the sideline as that sixth man. In the middle of the field, you get unbalanced, and you can really get hurt like they did earlier. Georgia Southern, you see, converting on 46% of their third down conversions. They've got one here. Gross rolling. And he stopped shy of the first down at the 36-yard line. Blankenship again, the linebacker, 
over there to provide coverage for Furman. Well, on this type of offense, you have to scrape your linebackers. There's no passing threat, so you bring them up. You hope they can beat the open field block. A good job by Blankenship. That's the toughest play of a linebacker, is to be running and have to take on a blocker because your legs are wide open. You don't have your feet under you. Blankenship did an excellent job of keeping his feet and then making the tackle on Gross. Well, we've played nearly half of quarter number one. We're scoreless from Idaho. Tonight's game is being brought to you by Ace Hardware Corporation. Ace is the place. And by the U.S. Army. Learn how to get an edge on life. Be all you can be. Tim Brando along with Stan White. We're at the Division I AA National Championship here in Pocatello, Idaho. And it's a field goal try coming up now for Georgia Southern. And it's their deep field goal kicker, David Cool, who kicks from 42 yards and out. This one will be 55 yards. Enough leg, and it's good. By plenty, Tim. He had a 60 earlier, but we saw him kicking 55, 58 yards going both directions in this dome. It's a great place for kickers. Last year, we saw Teddy Garcia, who was kicking for New England today, hit the roof. The altitude is high, and so are the Eagles here. 16 teams make the Division I AA playoffs, and here are the eight that drew the Furman bracket, Delaware, Marshall, and what was a revenge game out of the same conference, and then Furman getting by Idaho in the semifinal round. Georgia Southern, on the other hand, got past the Citadel, then Stephen F. Austin. The Lumberjacks went down and then bested Eastern Kentucky a week ago in a very close game to make it to the national championship finals. Already, a 55-yard field goal by that man, David Cool, to give the Georgia Southern Eagles a 3-0 lead. Just over seven minutes to play in the opening quarter. Matt Turner is back deep. And it will be Turner from his seven. at the 25-yard line. Donnie Allen, the first one to make the stop. And we have a marker down. In an area where we could have had a clip. Here's we have Larry Purina, our referee tonight. And there's Jimmy Satterfield. Here's a clip right there, number 52, right in the middle of your screen. He hits the... Well, number 40-something, and he hit him in the back and gives it away. When the referee can't read the number, he knows it. Jimmy Satterfield, as we mentioned, in his third year as the head football coach at Furman, 1962 graduate in South Carolina. 18 years he spent with Dick Sheridan. In fact, Sheridan was once his assistant in the high school ranks. From their patio at the 11, first down Furman. Beyond the 11 to the 15 yard line. Let's meet the Georgia Southern defensive deployment. Tim Brown out of Madison, Georgia, and Charlie Waller are the guards. The defensive tackles, Darren Alford and Gib Smith. The middle linebacker, he's a great one, Daryl Hendricks. And he's flanked by Michael Berry, a speedy guy, along with Everett Sharp. And the cornerbacks, Terry Young and Rodney Oglesby. And the safeties, Kevin Whitley and Randall Boone. Second and seven. And Bobby Doherty this time up to the 20-yard line. Shy of the first down by a couple of yards. Charlie Waller made the stop for the Eagle defense. Again, you see him running right at the linebackers. This is a new defense again for Georgia Southern. The Eagle seven. They have three stacked linebackers in the middle. The guys you call the defensive tackles, Alfred and Smith really play outside of the, the end men on the line, on each side of the line. With all those stacked linebackers, you have the bubbles to run at where the linebackers are deployed. The bus already has one long completion. It was thwarted by a fumble by Bagwell. He'll check off this time. And he checks right into a first down play. White Sterling picks up the necessary yardage before cornerback Rodney Oglesby, a freshman, could cut through there and make the stop. 
Again, running right at you, call the bubble where the linebacker is. You see it right there. He's off the line. There's some natural gaps there. This time he's cut off and can't get into the flow. The inside linebackers are great for flowing, but once they get cut off, there's a lot of natural gaps when they've got four guys, two wide and two in the middle. Quarles moves up to the top of your screen along with Lipscomb. First down, Bourbon. And it's Lipscomb. No quick out pattern beyond the 30 to the 32. Everett Sharp, the linebacker over there, drawing the defensive job of handling Lipscomb. And that's tough because we've already seen what he can do in the open field after a 48-yard reception earlier. And they plan to uh, feature him tonight. He only caught five passes all year, but he's got great speed, just a freshman. He's got a year under his belt now, and two passes he's caught already tonight. Well, they felt they had to throw the ball early and well in this game against Georgia Southern. Sterling getting most of that on his own out to near the 35 Darren Alford there to make the stop one of the reasons they felt they had to throw the ball a bit more early is because DeBusk does not have behind him Kenneth Goldsmith who coach Satterfield said is in fact a pro prospect he was injured and they do have a number of backs but they would hope to open up that Eagle 7 defense by virtue of first down and second down passing tonight. Well, again, the more you can get the linebackers to back up, the bigger the bubbles we're mm -hmm. talking about. The gaps between the line of scrimmage and where the linebacker lines up. It's tough for the defensive lineman to cover those if the linebackers aren't hitting them quick. To get them back a step to play the pass just creates bigger natural holes. Third down, and you see just uh, oh, inches to go for the first down. Satterfield and company look on. They'll bring in a couple of tight ends now into that offense. Swilling and Sipri. Third and inches. Bagwell. First down for the Paladins. On short yardage, Tim, if you're a linebacker, you just got to gamble and hope you can hit the right spot. You see Hendricks get through. That's not a bad job. He's hitting somebody behind the line. He doesn't get help. But if you're going to stop somebody with inches to go, you got to gamble. You got to shoot the gap, make the play. Hendricks took the gamble, didn't make it. But it's worth the gamble on third and short. First down and 10 now for Furman. With the ball at the 37-yard line. 3-0, Georgia Southern with the lead. Four minutes left in the first quarter. looks for quarrels and has him at the 48 yard line and another paladin first down randall boone the free safety they'd like to take advantage of him over there to make the stop out of bounds again first down you get a lot of time you don't you get play, people playing the run gives them plenty of time for the bus to set up again the matchup they want a wide receiver on randall boone number 49 you see Alfred, their big pass rusher. What's he doing? He's just playing the run. He's playing down the line of scrimmage. Number 66 P. Cowan did a good job, but you're helped by the situation. First and ten. Counter option to Backwell. To the 45 of the Eagles. Everett Sharp and Rodney Oglesby combine on the tackle. <laughs> that was almost a pass, Tim. He waited so long to make the pitch, it was almost parallel to the line of scrimmage. If it had been forward, it would have been uh, probably a penalty situation with linemen downfield. But since it was parallel, that is a lateral and illegal play. They really run a shuttle bus, don't they, between plays, going with three wideouts from time to time and using a wealth of running backs, this Furman Paladin team. Second down now and four yards to go. fake to busk in trouble from Gibbs Smith and Bagwell's got it. First down, just shy of the Georgia Southern 30. Nice play by Frank DeBus. Well, Bagwell is one of their best receivers. He missed the first four games of the year, yet he has, once he catches, leads the team, co-leader on the team. You see, he's forced out of the pocket, but look at this. Nobody picked up the back out of the backfield. They were in man-to-man -man defense. The linebackers got caught up on the flow. And Bagwell sneaks right out of the backfield. That's a tough play for a linebacker on that play action to find his coverage. Sixth all-time leading rusher at Furman, John Bagwell. Blitz coming. And the pitch. Bagwell. On the 26-yard line, Darrell Hendricks, the middle linebacker, the silent leader that we've been telling you about, made the stop. 
Well, you know you uh, have the defense on the run when they start blitzing you on first down because they know they just can't sit in the defense they're in and stop you. they got to start gambling. They're hoping to get uh, some penetration by Daryl Hendricks, who was blitzing up the middle on that play, number 43 in white, or by somebody from the outside for the play-action passes. One of the many walk-ons that made Eric Russell's team only 63 scholarships they have at Georgia Southern. And there's Sterling. Counter play. Just shy of the 20-yard line to the 21. Kevin Whitley, the cornerback, pressed into a starting job because of the injury to Taz Dixon, really one of the better secondary players. In fact, the best that Georgia Southern has made the stop. Good cut that time by Dwight Sterling. Quickly saw the opening on the back side. Again, you know when the linebackers blow out as Eagle 7? They blow too quick. It opens up even bigger holes. Fast pace, first quarter. It's first and 10 Furman. Black stops so they can get the chain gang in place. We have a minute and 38 seconds left to be played in the first quarter. Not much scoring, but a good deal of offense. So far, you've been right on target. This time, Bobby Doherty gets it. Up to crack him in a hurry with Steve Musiletti along with Patrick Parr. Just coming into the game, a freshman out of West Point, Georgia, number 90. And Doherty, the first cousin of former North Carolina center Brad Doherty, now with the Cleveland Cavaliers of the NBA. Didn't get his height, though. No, he didn't. <laughs> Second down at eight. Just over a minute to play. You see the time remaining. pass the tight end touchdown Brad Key the junior tight end from Cherokee Georgia Timmy couldn't ask for a better drive right up and down the field. Play action. This is another play action pass. They fake the option. Catch him in man-to-man. -man. Again, number 49, Randall Boone gets caught up in the play action, lets his tight end, Greg Key, number 87, get behind him for the easy touchdown. Connolly's extra point is good. And the Paladins have the lead. Now the sophomore quarterback, Frankie DeBus, is a real pumped up guy right now. He has his first touchdown pass in the national title game. Seven to three our score as Irk Russell's team is down with under a minute to play in the first quarter. He has to be concerned about his defense being on its heels in that last drive. Scoring drive so far in this game. Nine plays, 36 yards for the Eagles, culminating with a 55-yard kick by David Poole. And Furman's 13 plays, a textbook drive, and the touchdown pass from DeBusk to Greg Key. And they ate up 6-13 off the clock. Yeah, Furman has a great game plan. I'm sure they've looked at film. They looked at East, Eastern can, uh, Kentucky did last week with their power offense. They mixed in the play action pass. They've done a great job. As you said, they got the defense on their heels. They're backing up. Then they forced them to gamble. And they took advantage of that gamble, caught them in a blitz, man to man coverage, touchdown. Carl Miller back deep, number 24. Conley to boot it. Boy, he got all of this one, didn't he? <laughs> up against the wall in Idaho. Conley, great depth that time, and they love that. I like to play golf in a place like this. Jeez. The ball carrier or what? Just a junior from Noonan, Georgia. These two teams, one out of Greenville, South Carolina, the other from Statesboro, Georgia, and a number of Georgians on both of these rosters. That, by the way, is the horn ending the first quarter. <laughs> It also, uh, it also scared Stan White and I. <laughs> and we have concluded the first 15 minutes. Our score, 7-3, Paladins. Now that you mention it, the clock doesn't start till they snap again. 
Jim Brando along with Stan White. We're back here in Pocatello. We had a clock malfunction. Uh, after the horn sounded, uh, both Stan and I lost sight of the fact that 54 <laughs> seconds were left because the horn was so very loud. The clock had, had gone out. When yeah, the horn sounded. All the numbers came off the clock. Yeah, and the horn you hear from time to time still coming through. And I think they're trying to determine now just how much time is remaining in the first quarter. you got to believe somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 seconds plus. Yeah, well, maybe no time. I mean, the time it took the kick to go down to the end zone doesn't start again until the next snap. Yep. So we have a pause in play here, and you see nothing showing on the scoreboard here in Pocatello, Idaho. That's our excuse. <laughs> Lurk Russell knows his offense needs to get something going here. I'm really impressed with the way Furman's offense, as you said, was able to control the ball in that last drive. And Frankie DeBusk, I mean, you take away the fumble, Furman may have had a couple of touchdowns so far in this game. They've pretty much done whatever they wanted. Yeah, they've only stopped themselves. And that was the fumble where the running back Bagwell was trying to change from his right arm to his left, just missed his elbow, and it went out the backside. So they have done everything right offensively. Georgia Southern has got to start to do something different defensively. They even gamble more than they have send people. The clock is out. And they're waiting to have a timer brought down to the field level so they can keep official time. So we'll pause again and come back with more first quarter action. So a little more than 50 seconds remaining. 7-3 our score. And a fumble by Gross. And he's down a yard behind the line of scrimmage. Kelly Fletcher, number 82, there to make certain that Gross could not pick up any yardage after picking up the ball. Yeah, that was a uh, scary decision, I think, if I was a Georgia Southern coach, to see him pick it up and then try to run it again. Mm -hmm. and he's out there with the ball in his hands, could easily take a hit, and he didn't see it fumble again. Second down, 11 now for Georgia Southern. And there's the pitch, Frankie Johnson. Oh, nice hit. At the 25-yard line by Kelly Fletcher, number 82 again. And we have a marker down. There's Fletcher out of Dalton, Georgia. He, too, an outstanding student in the classroom as well. And we have another clip. And Georgia Southern going the other way. Yeah, they are doing it to themselves, making mistakes, uh, not blocking people, fumbling snaps, penalties uh, right and left on kickoffs. Here on the sweep, they had good yardage. Once again, a reminder for those of you just joining us, the clock is no longer functioning. Offense, repeat the down, second down. And the microphone on Furina also giving us some difficulty. Irk Russell's team is down by a score of seven to three. The official time is being kept on the field, and we have under 54 seconds remaining. Perhaps time for another play if it's a running play, perhaps two if they go to the air here. Second down and 17, whistles blow. And uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the first quarter. And there's the horn again. <laughs> 7-3 at the end of the first quarter. Now, in Statesboro, Georgia, they've got a huge creek there that they call Beautiful Eagle Creek. And there's a tradition that began five years ago when Irk Russell decided to take some water from Beautiful Eagle Creek to northern Arizona for their first road game and sprinkle it on the artificial turf in Flagstaff. Well, they won that game. It worked three more times. They're 4-0. They sprinkled it here. And, uh, well... Furman's got the answer in the form of Jimmy Satterfield's dad, Walt Satterfield, 71 years young, out of Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. He's the reverend there. He took the entire Furman team into the end zone and said the Lord's Prayer along with his son, Jimmy Satterfield, and they figured, hey, that's the best way to stop that beautiful water from beautiful Eagle Creek. Well, everybody's looking to make the home field feel like it's their field. They want to take it away from the other team. I think the Eagle Creek water is the beautiful Eagle Creek, excuse me. That's right. Water is a good gimmick. It makes you feel like you have a piece of that turf that's mm -hmm. your own. Eric Russell is the master of motivation, and he'll use even some superstition to motivate his players, and why not? 
One of the reasons he's so quotable and so well loved in the state of Georgia. Second down and 17 as we get underway in the second quarter. And Gross will sprint out and look for DeBus. Tipped in the air and intercepted. That's Blankenship at the 18-yard line. Timmy, it's just a delay pattern, number 48, pretends like he's going to block and then come out. Just a high throw by Gross. Blankenship gets one hand on it, bats it around, brings it in. Another big play for Furman, and Georgia Southern continues to self-destruct. First down, 10 for Frankie DeBusk and company. Quarles up at the top of your screen, first down. And the pitch to Bobby Doherty. Look at him go! Kevin Whitley and Randall Boone, the two safeties, saved the touchdown. Again, running right at that defense, right at the bubble by number 43. He gets knocked out of there. There's nothing there to make the tackle. He just cuts through the big hole. Elton Bailey finally gets him down, number 64, but Bobby Dougherty has the speed. He's really more of a tailback than Bagwell is. First down and 10. behind the line by the linebacker Michael Perry. He's the guy they like to send on the blitz when Georgia Southern does come with linebackers. He's got good speed. Got behind the line of scrimmage to bring in Doherty. He's first and goal, so it'll be second and goal coming up now for Frankie DeBusk and his troops. Well, that gamble worked. They brought everybody. They guessed the right side and end up in a two or three yard loss for Furman. Late substitution. Bagwell coming into the game. At the fullback spot. Play action fake. The bus in trouble. Get Smith. The sophomore from Mabletown, Georgia. Gets the sack back at the 17 yard line. Smith has 11 sacks on the year already. Rushes from the outside, contains him, forces him back to the inside, and just cleans up on the tackle for the tack for the sack. He's looking for the tight end. This time, Boone has good coverage on him. He thought he could sneak him down a second time. You get fooled one time, maybe. You better not get fooled twice. Timeout call by the Furman offense. They had the ball inside the 10, and they, too, have now fallen prey to going backwards. And it will be third down and goal coming up. Well, we've got a number of bowls coming up here in the month of December. The All-American Bowl gets it started in Birmingham, Alabama, December the 29th at 8 p.m. Illinois against the Florida Gators. Then it's the SeaWorld Holiday Bowl, December the 30th, and you'll see the Heisman Trophy winner, Barry Sanders, and the Cowboys of Oklahoma State against the Cowboys of Wyoming. And the only game you'll see January 1st this year, it's the Mazda Gator Bowl with the Spartans of Michigan State taking on the Georgia Bulldogs. And that should be an interesting game as well. The final game for Vince Dooley as head football coach of the Georgia Bulldogs. This may be the final game for Irk Russell, the Georgia Southern team. If you missed us at the outset, Irk Russell, Rumored highly now as the successor to Vince Dooley. Of course, he spent 17 seasons there as the defensive coordinator and was the author of the Junkyard Dogs in Athens. Third down, he's hoping his dogs hunker down now here as Eagles. The bus looking for quarrels picked off by Kevin Whitley. Couldn't have come at a better time for Irk's bunch. He's looking for Quarles. The slot ran it down and out. Quarles run a post over the middle. Whitley comes over out of nowhere. See him coming. Looks like he's open. But here comes Whitley playing the center field perfectly, coming down with the pass. Now he's playing again because that Taz Dixon is hurt, but he comes up with a big play for Georgia Southern. First and ten now, Eagles with the ball at the 20-yard line. Just underway, second quarter. Is stopped again. Boy, the Furman defense, Chris Roper, the defensive end that time, playing that option very, very well on the outside. 
Storyline, Pocatella debust six out of seven, 99 yards, one touchdown, but that interception moments ago. Georgia Southern, not even half of Furman's total yards in offense. And the first downs, well, that also tells you the story. Eight to two, but the big story is only four points separating these two early in the second quarter. Reverse, Belser, Tony Belser, and they smelled it. The Paladins came with the arsenal. Dean Williams, the nose guard, but credit Fletcher for really making certain that play would not work. Again, Fletcher, the rush end stays at home. That's what you have to do. You're not going to catch plays from the backside. You're not going to run down people. Both Blankenship and Fletcher had it well smelled out. Forced Belser to go back to the middle where all the pursuit was. A big loss. Again, third and long. They hate this. We have no clock. A little more than 12 minutes remaining now in the second quarter. Gross for Belzer. Incomplete. Out of bounds. Over there covering was Julius Dixon, the cornerback for Furman. And it's fourth down in a punt formation for the Eagles. Even if he'd have caught it, it'd still be fourth down because he was a couple yards short of first down yardage. Again, those long yard situations are not made for Raymond Gross in this uh, triple option offense. Terry Harbin will punt the ball away. He already has a 62 yarder tonight. <laughs> It's this one high into the air. Pat Turner calling for a fair catch at the 42-yard line of Georgia Southern. The Paladins have the lead and the ball on the plus side of the field when we come back. Tonight's Division I AA National Championship game is being brought to you by Acclaim Entertainment, makers of NFL VCR quarterback and the best in VCR sports games. And by True Value Hardware. For quality, selection, and personal attention, make True Value Hardware your store of first choice. Tim Brando, Stan White, Pocatello, Idaho. The official time there, 11.55 remaining second quarter. Furman with the ball, first and 10. And Dwight Sterling inside the 35. And a healthy game before Whitley, who got the interception moments ago, could trip him up. Well, we talked about uh, in pregame, Tim, a team that played the better defense would win the national championship. I don't think there's any argument who's playing better defense so far tonight. Furman playing excellent defense against that triple option. And Georgia Southern just having its hands full with the power offense of Furman. Second down. And a short three yards to go coming up. Bobby Doherty, first down. 12 Everett Sharp and Randall Boone made the tackle. Well, Bobby's pretty excited. Again, you have all these stacked linebackers. If they flow correctly, they're fine. But if they overrun plays, you see right there, number 43, Hendricks, Daryl Hendricks, overruns the play. He can't get the cut back by Dougherty, and then it's just a foot race. He's the better tailback, the free tailback. They like to run him on the sprint draws like we just saw Bagwell more in the power plays. First down and 10 with the ball at the 13-yard line. The official spotting of the ball. And Sterling gets it. Comes back through. Down to the 10-yard line. Michael Berry, 6'2 freshman, outside linebacker out of Atlanta, Georgia, made the stop. There's Sterling, who had 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 been questionable early in the week. They've had some injury problems in that Furman backfield that we told you about. I think he plays both ways, Tim. He played yeah. the eight plays at defensive tackle last week and even had a sack. Started out as a nose tackle. Moved him to running back. Refrigerator. Sterling gets it again. He stopped for no gain this time. Darrell Hendricks met him in a hurry. That was the give to the fullback there. They come back with the companion play and fake to him, come out with the option, the counter option. It was wide open. They had one man for the quarterback and the tailback. They're going to come back to that. A couple of tight ends being shuttled now. Keith Swilling into the game for Furman. Extra linebacker, Trey Smith in the game for Georgia Southern. DeBusk, plenty of time. 
and throws it away. They ran out of time. Good coverage that time by Georgia Southern secondary. The bus got all kinds of time and simply had to get rid of it. Well, he liked John Bagwell. He's trying to run an option pattern, but he has zone coverage. He didn't find the opening. So DeBus just threw it away out of the end zone. Good coverage by Everett Sharp. Really double-team linebacker in and out on Bagwell. Conley will now try a field goal. They'll mark it at the 18 at the 10, and it's a 28-yard attempt. And it's blocked by Mark Giles. He had two earlier in the year. He just got number three. In fact, he had a big block punt last week. He had turned the game around and really got them to this championship game. So, Furman loses another scoring chance. They still lead by four. Thank you, John. Boy, a couple of surprises there. Notre Dame Pat. losing to Valparaiso. And Tennessee going down and Georgia beating Georgia Tech, although Georgia's uh, considered a favorite in the Southeastern Conference this year. Hugh Durham is loaded. Bobby Crimmins and Durham's Dogs have always had great games when those two teams have met on Peachtree Street. First down, Georgia Southern from the 10. We've got a marker down. Too much time, apparently, perhaps to call. Maybe some encroachment. Alan Edwards cut through there. Yeah, they got the quick shift. They shifted the running back rather than motion. Mm -hmm. The nose guards went on the motion and jumped offside to get a freshman. Yeah, the ball's right in front of him. Why can't he just see that? But he, see, he can go over and get back, but once you make contact, the play's dead. He leaned into that yeah, zone ball, there. And the ball's right there, Timmy. Tell him to look at it. That's right. First and five now. And they go up the middle again to Joe Ross. And that block kick just moments ago. Remember, Giles has three of them now, and you see a problem at the upper right-hand portion. Stan. Yeah, watch the wingback, number 41, Ron Sherwood. He gets what's called the short corner. Watch him go way down to the inside. That cuts the angle down. That gives him that one extra step. It allows him to come in and block the punt. Mark Giles, number 10, third block kick on the season. Again, second in the playoffs. A big one last yeah. week and another big one today. There he is on the sideline. And he's having to play a lot, too, because of Taz Dixon's injury. Freshman earning his stripes out of Warner Robins, Georgia. Second and three. Play action. Gross sprinting out away from trouble. Oh, nice move. Out of bounds. He's resourceful, isn't he? Out to the 27-yard line. Jeff Blankenship, the linebacker, needs perhaps some oxygen after trying to run him down. Well, we talked about their better athletes and trying to get them in the open field to make moves, use their athleticism. Watch him right here, Raymond Gross. He missed one, two, three guys missing him. Goes down the sideline, gets the first down, gets out of bounds. Doesn't have to take a big hit, so he didn't have to pay for all that. Defensively, if a guy does that to you, you got to make him pay. You can't let him get out of bounds free. Uh, Co-captain Blankenship cracked him out of bounds at the 27-yard line. First down, 10. And it's Ross again. Well, that play has been stopped sufficiently by Furman tonight. Tell you what, Alan Edwards getting the job done. Exactly what I was going to say. You got the freshman on the All-American center, Dennis Franklin, number 76. Well, Alan Edwards is uh, not giving an inch in that battle. In fact, he's probably taking that battle as we look at it right now because they've been trying to get Ross up the middle all night. He had nowhere to go. You know, Fee Cowan, well, he's good friends with Alan Edwards. Edwards looks a little like Fee, so they call him Fi. And then Eric Robinson, the tackle on the opposite side of Youngster, is full. So there's Fee, Fi, and Foe up front defensively at times for the Furman defense. And Carl Miller gets it. And he may have a first down to the 38-yard line. Again, the key to any option is the other back is not carrying the football, blocking. Watch Frank Johnson, number 48. Just arcs out, and it makes a great block on number 88, Chris Roper. It sets... Carl Miller free. Look, he's just got a man's on the ground. He's just got to get over him, and he gets good yards. Just hangs onto the football barely, but the block by Frank Johnson was the key. And he is their best blocker, Carl Miller. One of many that they'll utilize out of that slot back spot. Lost the lone setback, and he gets it. Stopped at the 41-yard line. Kevin Kendrick, the weak side linebacker, sophomore from Smyrna, Georgia. Number 57. 
fiery guy, loves to play the pass, won't get many opportunities against this Georgia Southern offense, though. Well, they're where they want to be, though, Tim, in the middle of the field, so they can count and see which side the defense has six men on and go the other way with the option, try to catch them a man short. Second down, seven now. Gross keeping it beyond the 50 to the 49-yard line, and that's another Georgia Southern first down. They'd love to uh, just get the ball in the middle of the field every play, Timmy. Tonight's student of the game is brought to you by the U.S. Army. Learn how to get an edge on life. Be all you can be. And our student of the game is Chris Roper out of Furman. 3.5 GPA in physics and pre-engineering. There he is. You know, the guy on the other side that does an outstanding job, Chris Roper, is also a 3.5 student. Kelly Fletcher, I should say, the other guy on the opposite side, another outstanding student. And that's Gross behind the line of scrimmage at midfield being dragged to the ground. Brian Pitts, the tackle, making the stop. Well, again, the guy you just talking about, though, the other defensive end who was a academic All-American himself, Kelly Fletcher, contained Gross. He stayed outside. You forced Gross to cut back, and you got all your other 10 players in there to come in and help on that uh, great athletic ability of Gross. He's an accounting major and has a 3.5. 7-3, Furman, second quarter, second down 11 for Georgia Southern. And Ross finally breaks free. Well, they kept it going, and they finally got it to work. And what they did, Tim, is they put, instead of the balanced formation, they put trips to the right side and ran back to left. You see Ross, he's got a little ankle problem there as he limps off the field, but that was wide open. The defense over committed to the trip side, the three receiver side, and left the gap for Joe Ross. Ross had a strained ankle earlier in the week, a bruised shoulder and a broken hand all this year. He's been beset with injuries all season long. First and ten. Close to keep it this time. And a nice maneuver up front by Paul Craven, the right side tackle. He's really been the most pleasant surprise of this Furman defensive deployment. Senior out of Boone, North Carolina, taking the stop. We can watch the uh, guard, Sean Ganey, number 51. There's too many people on there. He gets an excellent block. He knocks the linebacker blankets it way out. And there's too many people over there. They had it well defensed as far as deploying their number of people. Raven's dad, by the way, is a professor at Appalachian State in Boone. Up the middle, Gary Miller, the fullback, senior out of Augusta, Georgia. Gets about five before Kevin Kendrick could haul him down. Ball at the 31-yard line. Third down, long yardage again. Well, now the clock is yeah, on again. That. It shows seven minutes, but again, that's unofficial time. We have not received word as yet if, in fact, the clock is official. And you see there, seven minutes showing a 7-3 game. Donnie Allen in the game, replacing Belser. And Gross is stopped again. Kevin Kendrick again, the weak side linebacker, Pierce through to cut him down. They're just playing good, sound, stay-at-home defense. The counters aren't working. The reverses aren't working. Everybody's playing their responsibility. That's what good defense is. Take care of your responsibility, then go help somebody. Harvin will hold for David Cooley. Already has a 55-yarder. This one will be from 48. from Furman, 7-3, and a rivalry renewed. That's the official time remaining up at the top of your screen. Furman leading 7-3. An interesting building here, the Holt Arena. You'll see how the ceiling is set, and there are the suspended goalposts. And if the brackets you see up at the top of the orange goalpost, if the ball, if a field goal hits those brackets, they'll re-kick. Now, if, in fact, the ceiling comes into play here at Holt Arena and the ball hits the ceiling, then it's up to the officials to determine if the trajectory of the ball would have made the field goal good or not good. But 
I get that right? <laughs> Sounded good to me, Jim. <laughs> From the 31, first down, Furman. The bus, the option to Bagwell. He has room outside to the 41-yard line, and perhaps another first down. Michael Berry made the stop. Well, Tim, we've seen both offenses going up and down the field tonight. Look at that. 183 to 93. Won't be long until we're going to have 300 yards of total offense, yet the score is 7 to 3. A couple missed field goals, one block, three turnovers. The defenses have bent, bent, and bent, yep. but not have, have not broken again, yeah. as we talked about, only, not yet. Only one big play, and that was negated by the Furman fumble by Bagwell on the opening drive. A play action. They go wide, and it doesn't work. Lipscomb stopped in a hurry by Terry Young. Again, that's the third pass that Lipson has caught tonight. He had five for the season. I mean, for 14 games going into the night. So you know that they didn't use him that much, but they like his speed, especially on this artificial turf. It makes you a little bit faster. They figure if he gets the ball, he may break a big play like he did on the opening play. Yeah, Lipscomb does have four, five, six speed in the 40, and that's on grass on this turf. You figure he can get along a little faster than that. Time is official now on the clock. 3-11 and counting. The bus looking for his man. He's got him. Keith Swilling, the tight end to the 33-yard line. Kevin Whitley made the tackle of Swilling. Again, that's the play that was the touchdown play. It's a fake of a down-the-line option. Try to hold the free safety, hold the linebacker, get the tight end over top in between. Free safety's got to make that play. Whitley made the interception earlier, but he's got to get to that hash while the ball's in the air and make the play on the tight end that far downfield. Swilling, one of three tight ends that Coach Satterfield will utilize. He's considered the better receiving tight end. The bus so far having a very good first half. Bobby Doherty again. Boy, good peripheral vision by the youngster. Out of bounds at the 18-yard line. The sophomore. Bobby Doherty. Again, with the stacked linebackers, you have to stay behind the ball carrier. You get going one direction. He doesn't play that too bad. It's the backside linebacker, Hendricks, I mean, doesn't play too bad. Number 43, watch him here. He's staying pretty much there. It's the backside linebacker, number 37, that overruns the play. Then the Everett Sharp, and then the official blocks out one of the defensive backs that was coming up to try to make the play. Kevin Whitley again. Official health, pretty good block. First and 10. And the pitch is to Bagwell. Stopped quickly by Tim Brown, the guard in that 4-3 front, utilized by defensive coordinator Mike Healy and company. Just a sophomore out of Madison, Georgia. Bag will stop, little gain if any. This is the toughest uh, type of offense for all these stacked linebackers to play against. Because you want to flow, but if you do, you're open up holes for cutbacks. If you don't, then they're going to run right at you. And if you don't come up to take it up, take the play on, there's going to be natural holes. Second down and eight. Play action fit. They go on the toss to Bagwell. Down to the 12, so they fake the counter and go wide. And once again, Bagwell runs out of terrain. You know, we talked about the uh, triple option offense at Georgia Southern and Raymond Gross and how he runs the option. Well, Frankie DeBusk is running the option real well tonight. Now, he's not going to get any yardage, but he's making the right decisions. He's making the people come to him and pitching late and give him that one extra step it needs to get the yardage get around the corner. Sophomore from Greenville, Tennessee, has had a very good first half. Third down five. Tosses it out to Bagwell. That could be a lateral, and he's on top of it at the 20-yard line. No doubt it was a lateral. That was backwards two, three yards, so it's going to be a loss of about 10 yards on the play. Bagwell did a good job of recognizing the fact that it was a backwards pass, which is a lateral, and getting on the football. So it's field goal time again for Furman. Now remember, they had a couple of opportunities that went awry. The last one, of course, the blocked field goal try by Giles, number 10, who sets up on the wide side, on the right-hand side defensively. There he is, the right-hand side of your screen. This will be 36-yard attempt. Giles doesn't get there, and the kick is good. the Paladins convert this time around with a 
the help of Glenn Conley, the junior from Noonan, Georgia. 10-3 our score now. Furman with the lead. And don't forget, for college basketball, I'll be joined with Dick Vitale in Lexington, Kentucky. Rough arena, the side as the Hoosiers take on the Wildcats Tuesday night. And our doubleheader dose of college basketball will continue with the Buckeyes of Ohio State. Yeah, I know, Stan. You went to school there. Against the Gamecocks of South Carolina, 9.30 Eastern time. Watch this. See the, look how they line up differently. You see there's two men on the corner this time. Number 87, Greg Key, as well as number 41, Ron Sherwood. It allows them a bigger angle to make, Key, to make uh, Giles go a little bit wider, and he couldn't get there that time. So they put two men off the line to not give him the short corner we talked about before, the sharp angle. Remember our first game, Furman, you see 10-3, our first Division I AA game of the year. Northern Iowa was playing in Northern Arizona. Earl Bruce just resigned at Northern Iowa. Don Saunders will update that story for you, along with a lot more at halftime. Carl Miller takes the kickoff beyond the 20 to the 22-yard line. Mike Jones made the stop, and of course, he's been widely rumored to be the next head coach at Minnesota. And Colorado State and other places, uh, he's been a traveling man. Mm -hmm. He's been rumored for uh, more jobs than there is colleges, I think, <laughs> around the last couple of years. But uh, of course, Earl was an assistant when I was in Ohio State. He did a great job at Ohio State for nine years. And, uh, you know, when we talked about Northern Iowa, we just couldn't see him staying in that situation if something better happened. It was a great opportunity for him to coach this year, but it didn't look to be long-term for him. Remember, Rick Bay, his athletic director that resigned at Ohio State after the firing of Earl late last year, he is now the new athletic director at Minnesota, and thereby all of the speculation that Earl will join him. Georgia Southern on first down, four yards or more, 0 for 11. Well, that's not the way Irk Russell's offense is supposed to work. No, it isn't. And, uh, and Furman is doing a great job on first down. Georgia Southern obviously not putting themselves in the situation because long yardage is not made for this offense. They got to come up with some first down plays. We have an injured official right now. We'll check on his status. Irk Russell over there showing some concern, which is nice to see. First down, Georgia Southern. That's the kind of conversion on first down they need. Right on cue up to the 36-yard line. Only 56 seconds remaining in the half. Again, yeah, Furman playing a little bit softer in those situations. Linebackers a little deeper open up that fullback play. Again, John Saunders will be by at halftime. Gross looking to throw. Belser is open. He didn't find him in time. Now his offensive linemen are knocking him ahead to the 42-yard <laughs> line before Fletcher and Craven combine on the tackle. And a timeout called by Georgia Southern with 40 seconds left. Yep. We'll return to Pocatello, Idaho in just a moment. Right now the Eagles down by a touchdown. Back in Pocatello, Idaho, where the Furman Paladins lead Georgia Southern 10-3, 40 seconds remaining in the first half. Two-minute drill, and uh, again, that's not made for this uh, flexbone offense. It could uh, put them in a situation they don't want to be. Tony Belser's the speed merchant. They're looking for him right now. Gross will have to tuck it. He can do a lot of damage this way. He stopped at the 49-yard line. More importantly, the clock continues to tick. They'll move the chain and stop the clock. 31 seconds remaining on the first down play. That may be their best pass play. Yep. Let everybody clear out and give him some open field. Let him run with the football. They'll throw this one away and almost picked off by Roper. Boy, the sophomore nearly made a freshman mistake. Huh. Again, you don't want to have this situation offensively because it's not made for what you do and you could make a big mistake and that was almost a big mistake we were alluding to they make a big mistake here and it could negate all the good things they've done in the first half which basically boils down to the fact they've only given up 10 points despite giving up a number of yards Elzer number 21 as we mentioned the wide receiver they like to look for deep the bust flanks out Worsham's in the game as well four wide receivers Frankie Johnson drops it at the 40-yard line and hit him right in the numbers. 
Frankie Johnson switched. He's usually the tight slot. He went out to the wide slot. When people do that, it's for a purpose. They just wanted to get him the football, let him run with it. The guy averages 14.5 yards a carry, as Gross. well as 18 yards a catch. Gross is 0 for tonight. His only completion to the wrong team. And of course, they have not been able, at least at certain times in this game, to free up that passing game, what little they like to use with their running game. Also has only broken that interior play once or twice. Gross, under pressure, running out of room and time. But boy, can he use the terrain. Let's it fly, incomplete for DeBus. Frankie Johnson, I should say, the intended receiver. Number 48 for Georgia Southern. That'll run out the clock if you do something like that. It's a Fran Tarkenton type scramble yeah. here. He's looking, looking, he goes to his right. I mean, <laughs> watch number 88, Chris Roper. He gets up, 82, excuse me, Kelly Fletcher. He gets knocked down, gets up, gets knocked down again. There goes Chris Roper. He does a good job making him pull up and throw the ball. But again, another incompletion, 0 for 5. That play took 15 seconds. Only seven left. And another timeout call. Coming up at halftime, our good friend John Saunders will be by. He'll have highlights from today's NFL action. New England Patriots took it on the chin. College basketball highlights as well. Top 20 scores, all of that coming your way at halftime. And there you see the Cardinals in conclave. Irk Russell talking with his sophomore quarterback. There's Bobby Johnson, the defensive coach, and even the head coach, Jimmy Satterfield, will tell you he controls the Paladin defense. Well, he's the one coach that stayed when Dick Sheraton left after the national championship game that Furman lost to Georgia Southern in 1985. Sheraton, of course, going to North Carolina State. Bobby Johnson said, hey, I'll stay with you. Give me a good salary. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. And he did. And it's been worth it because he's done a great job with the Furman defense. Again, ranked number one in the country, giving up less than 10 points a game, nine points a game. Two statements he made to us earlier in the week. Bobby Johnson, don't let Joe Ross beat you up the middle. And he was concerned that his team not give up the big play. So far, his team's done both. He was afraid a little to me open field confrontations with their athletes. They've done a good job against staying at home and helping each other. Taking care of their responsibility then helping their teammate after and only after they've taken care of their job. Well, it's fourth down and this is likely to be the final play of the half. Oh, big Ben action. They're going for Belser deep. Out of bounds. Tony made a great grab, but they had run out of real estate. And we've run out of time. In the first half, Jimmy Satterfield's rotten, a happy man. His team leads Herc Russell's by a score of 10-3 at halftime. Stan White and I will be back. But right now, let's go to John Saunders. Okay, thanks a lot, Tim Brando. Have gun will travel. The Paladins have the lead 10-3 at halftime. The Division I AA Championship game, Georgia Southern has some making up to do. They're down to Furman 10 to 3. Right now, let's go back to Pocatello, Idaho, and join Tim Brando and Stan White. John Saunders, thank you very much. We're at the Holt Arena in Pocatello, Idaho. 10-3, Furman with the lead. Along with Stan White, I am Tim Brando. And the story to this game, Stan, really has been missed opportunities for the Paladins. They lead the game, but should be leading by far more than this. And Furman has moved the ball up and down the field but they have thrown the football away. Watch this fumble by John Bagley. Nobody even hits him. Just goes to change his arms. He loses the football out the backside. Georgia Southern recovers. Now, Georgia Southern has bent this whole playoff series, but has not broke. Bagwell's fumble, and then again inside the 20-yard line, DeBusk looking, and Kevin Whitley stepped in. Yeah, did a good job. He's in there because of, as a late replacement for Taz Dixon, just a freshman, made a nice play. Now, here's a block kick. Now, there's two, two uh, uh, turnovers and a block kick. Watch the short corner. Mark Giles coming down, getting his hands on the football, blocking the kick. Three opportunities missed by Furman. How many times does that come back in the second half to haunt you? Statistically, this game has been all Furman's as well. 
Let's start with in the air, seven out of nine, a shutout being thrown against Georgia Southern. Well, that's the big difference, 124 to nothing, seven out of nine for Furman, zero out of six for Georgia Southern. And the turnovers, again, the key, as we mentioned earlier, add to that the block field goal, and those are three scoring chances by the boards. Georgia Southern will kick off for Irk Russell's team, and could it be his last half as head coach of this Division I AA powerhouse? Jimmy Satterfield looking for his first national championship at Furman. Here's the kick at Turner back deep, three yards deep, and he'll down it. First and 10 for Furman at their own 20-yard line. The possessions in the first down, four plays and a fumble after a long pass for Furman. 13-yard, 13-play drive ending in a touchdown. They had that blocked field goal after the interception, and then a field goal. We have a referee down on the field, Larry Ferreira, that has his microphone open. I don't think he's aware of it just yet, but you may from time to time hear him as our referee. First and 10 for Furman. And Dwight Sterling will take it. Tim Brown made the stop. I'm interested to see what adjustments now Georgia Southern has made at halftime. They got shoved back off and down the line of scrimmage in the first half. The linebackers have got to stay at home. Number 37 that time, Everett Sharp, stayed at home. He was ready for the cutback by Sterling. You know, they just got to play their position. Second down, six yards to go with the ball at the 24. bus down at the 22 and it's another sack for Darren Alford and we've got Dwight Sterling down on the field the injured Paladin Darren Alford with that sack 15 sacks in 11 games this year and you see Sterling favoring that shoulder right now good man-to-man -man coverage by Georgia Southern on that uh, second down and long play Looking for the curl pattern, nothing there. So now puts them in third long. Georgia Southern has to like this situation. They can get their two ends, Darren Alford and Giff Smith, who have 16 and a half and 11 sacks, respectively, into the pass rush. Don Clardy has come into the game now. One setback, that is Bagwell on third down and seven. He'll run near the first down marker. Maybe a bit shy, a half yard or so. Daryl Hendricks and Michael Berry, the two linebackers, closed quickly on DeBusk, who's dangerous, as is his counterpart in the open field. It'll be fourth down. Good coverage again. They went to the man defense, took all the short routes away. They got to go back to something long again to open them up, make them respect the long pass like that opening play of the game to Lipscomb. Bruce Like will punt the ball away for Furman. He'll get it away around his 15. That's Rodney Oglesby back deep for Georgia Southern, the single safety. And we've got a marker down. And Georgia Southern may have made the mistake they couldn't make in a fourth and short. Oh, they say it went against Furman. They were trying to get an offsides penalty that time with a cadence and it backfired. Jim Mutimer, pretty happy about it, number 42. Herb Russell's team will get the ball again, fourth and seven now. You look at the captain, number 86, Swilling, getting the word from Larry Farina, our referee. So now Like will have to punt from his patio, standing now at his 10-yard line. You see his average for the season, and Oglesby, Good return man as well. They're bringing people. They don't get it. Oglesby will at his 40. Trying to get outside and does not. Stop made by Taylor Quarles, the reserve cornerback. Georgia Southern's possessions. Well, three plays and out early. They did get a field goal of 55 yards after a nine-play drive, then an interception, three plays and out again, and the missed field goal, and then a seven-play drive that was halted by the intermission. 
Now we'll see what uh, adjustments that Georgia Southern has made offensively. They could get anything going in the first half. And we'll see what they've done to try to open up that triple option for Raymond Gross. Some changes in the offensive forward wall for Georgia Southern. We'll outline them for you in a moment. There goes Ross on the toss. Now to the 45-yard line. The left side tackle, Tony Smith. The usual starter is out of the game. George Jones has come in at the left tackle spot. He, along with Sammy Twiggs now, are the two tackles for Georgia Southern. So some changes made to perhaps give them a better break on the ground in the second half. Second down, five for Raymond Gross. Gross, that's the play that has not worked tonight. One of the reasons, 73 Allen Edwards, though that time, it was Pitts and Blankenship on the stop. There's the freshman 73. And again, what you want is a stalemate. He gets double teamed, gets in the ball lane, does a good job, and allows number 69, Brian Pitts, to come off his block and make the tackle. He closed down the hole, which you have to do as a nose man. Remember, Wayne Burr broke his arm in the second playoff game, and that pressed Edwards into duty. Third and four. Rose keeps it. He's perhaps into first down territory, although it appears where they marked the ball is a bit shy. He pierced the Paladin territory, but perhaps not quite enough for the first down. Again, Allen Edwards getting double teamed, does a good job, does not get shoved back off the line, and he gets free and goes down the line of scrimmage to help out on the tackle. He's playing an excellent ball against an All-American, Dennis Franklin, number 76 in white, All-American center for Georgia Southern. Shy of the first down by a very short distance. So Eric Russell's got a decision to make. In their short yardage offense that they'll utilize from time to time, they'll bring in an offensive lineman, Mike Wagner, and he will dress in number 91 and become eligible. He will be a twin tight end look, but he'll be the only eligible tight end. Lester Eford comes into the game as well, along with Ernest Thompson for Georgia Southern on fourth down, and the ball just inside the 50-yard line. They go to the power eye, Tim. No slot backs. There's three men in power eye formation. Tailback usually gets the football. This is the sneak situation here. Thompson, first down. Running behind Wagner, along with Ganey on that right side, and Eric Russell's gamble work. Again, Ernest Thompson, the full, the uh, slot back goes to tailback. He scored 22 touchdowns from this formation. Just two lead blocks by the two fullbacks in to do just that opens up the hole. But again, you think inches with a guy like Gross, why not uh, sneak it? If anybody gets penetration on that, you can end, end up losing the football. Georgia Southern just three for 15 on first down. They need four yards or more most times. And there's a near turnover. Gross, I don't know how he came up with it in midair, but he did. Kevin Kendrick, the weak side linebacker, could have taken it out of midair and been long gone. Second time that's happened. Again, they start to move, get something going. They self-destruct. Just didn't get the handle on the football. They really changed their offense quite a bit this second half, going to a trips formation. You see, he never got it. He wanted to give it to the fullback. Luckily, it bounced back to him. They've gone strictly. You see, three receivers to one side, not the even formation. Third down, second down. I beg your pardon. And the pass for Bowser. Just shy of a first down. Tony Belzer, who had caught a pass in each of his 24 games until last week, comes up with a reception here. A good throw this time by Raymond Gross. The sideline pattern, the toughest throw to make. He puts it right on the money, but a great catch by Belzer. You see that ball go all the way through his fingers, and he catches the back nose of the football. Great catch by Belzer. Third down, less than a yard. Gross now one for seven, his first completion of the game. Third and one, Miller and Thompson and Eford in there. Thompson stopped up. Boy, the Paladin defensive forward wall right there. He may not have the first down. That time they ran away 
from the power eye formation where they have the two blocking backs they ran to the single side and they got penetration Berman did and stopped the play Brian Pitts and company in on the stop watch the linebacker get through there come from the backside gets in the line of scrimmage and number 50 Jeff Blankenship that's the play that stopped it the guy that coming in second first man holds him up the second man knocks him back towards Blankenship all right 91 once again up at the top of your screen he's eligible fourth and inches Thompson, same play, same result. First down, Georgia Southern at the 37-yard line of Furman. And they went to the double backs that time, to the power side of the formation to get that extra running back. Linebackers were blitzing through Furman. Both of them were trying to go through the strong gap. Watch Blankenship and Kendricks come through right there. It's a good job. It just doesn't quite get the penetration that's... Uh, necessary to stop it on short yardage out of Smyrna Georgia Evan Kendrick first down and 10 a late substitution now Carl Miller into the game and Ross stopped shy of the 35 there's Kevin Kendrick again hit him right in the face Ian Blankenship both there with the top two tacklers on this squad, Blankenship 222, Kendrick 170. That's the way you play. You play as a tandem. You can't get split. That's why they've been effective defensively. The linebackers have been running up and down the line of scrimmage, making tackles. Or not many false steps for those linebackers. Well, against this type of offense, you can't afford false steps. Second and eight. The stop was Wade Sexton, the strong safety junior out of Lake City, Tennessee. Again, that was caused, though, by the good fill by number 50, Jeff Blankenship. He was coming inside out and forced the running back who wanted to cut inside that block to bounce outside. Now, the blocker was trying to push Sexton out. He just ran right into him. There's the All-American Jeff Blankenship, number 50. Ball is marked at the 39. Third down, 12. Gross in a heap of trouble. Gets it away to Worsham. Ross Worsham on a first down at the 24-yard line. What resiliency by Gross. Was he down when he threw it? I don't believe he was. He almost was thrown. The officials are even talking about it. If there was in the grass, maybe, but not in this league. Well, I know, but it's his knee down when he throws the football. Let's watch right there. Uh, it's hard to see as we're shielded by number 84. It's tough to see who'd end up catching that football. Ross Worsham. Well, Here it is again. The knee down. Is it down? I don't oh, think so. Real close, Timmy. It was close, but I don't think so. I thought it was a good call. Close as pitch to Frankie Johnson to the wide side of the field. A marker down thrown right at Gary Miller. Might have been guilty of the clip. Carl Miller, I beg your pardon. And I think he just tackled the man. Yep. Holding. And that will move Georgia Southern back. A lot of times you get away with that. Those uh, slot backs get away with actually tackling the blocker because they're so busy watching uh, the running play that they don't notice the uh, slot back tackling the defensive back. You watch right here in the right hand. Right there, he's grabbing his leg as he tries to get up. Still, number 23, Wade Sexton, gets up and gets in on the offense. Repeat the down. Still first down. Eric Russell's team. Trailing 10-3, long drive though to start this third quarter. Seven minutes and eight seconds remaining. By the way, we had difficulty with the clock in the first half. At halftime, they shut the clock off and sprayed Freon to cool it down. So the air conditioning system getting a workout to make certain that the time you see remaining is efficient. Just under seven minutes remaining. First and 20. It's up the middle to Gary Miller, senior from Augusta, Georgia. Sammy Walker, the left side tackle, sophomore out of Greenwood, South Carolina, number 76, there to make the stop for Furman. Again, everybody driving up and down the field, but 
really neither team been able to uh, really capitalize on all the opportunities they've had. Georgia Southern needs to get points out of this drive because it's been a long, effective drive for them to come away with nothing would be really devastating to them to start the second half. Donnie Allen in the game now. Raymond Gross, nothing doing that time. Like one of his own offensive linemen got shoved right back into him and he fell over top of him as he was faking the ball to the fullback. Now this is the situation defensively you'd like to be in third on against this team. This is the type you can come up with the big plays defensively. Herman Faithful hoping their defense can come through against Raymond Gross. Third and 18. action pass coming up. Gross, well, he had Worsham, but ran out of time. And once again, Sammy Walker, the backup left tackle, comes up with the big play. Again, that is the big play. You're talking about defensively, sacks, interceptions, fumble recoveries. You put them in situations they don't want to be, you need to make big plays. And Burm has done it tonight. Cool from 40 to 49. 50% on the air. High snap. This one from 48 yards. And it's good. Remember those missed opportunities for the Paladins. It could come back to haunt them. 10-6. 5-0-7 to play third quarter. Tonight's game is being brought to you by the Ralston Purina Company of Checkerboard Square. And by the number one ski boot in the world, Nordica. Reach a new high. Scoring drive for Georgia Southern. Look at that. 16 plays, 29 yards, 534. The penalties, I'm sure, had uh, that statistic come to the forefront. David Kuhl with the 48-yard field goal. He has a 48-yarder and a 55-yarder. What a strange-looking scoring drive, though. Less than two yards a, a play on that scoring drive, but they did get some points out of it, three points out of it, which means if they score the uh, touchdown, then they do go ahead. So they're within the striking distance of a single score to go in the lead. It's cool. amazing considering the game so far, Tim. Cool will kick off. Turner is back deep. And this goes out of bounds. And a marker down, and they'll have to do it all over again. You're looking now at Larry Farina, who is our referee, but that is Dennis Peterson, our linesman, who you'll recall was injured in the first half. Not expected to return, <laughs> the official word from the booth. In fact, our liaison has been dressed into duty to replace Dennis here in the second half. Kirk Russell using all 52 of his players tonight. The NCAA says that the rosters have to be down to 52 for playoff games. Both teams using a wealth of talent in tonight's game. Cool to kick off again. This time it does get into the end zone. And it will be a touchback and first down 10 Furman from their 20 when we return. Our score, 10-6 Paladins. The Gator Bowl will cap it off. There's Dwight Sterling cracking through to the 24-yard line before Darren Alford could make the tackle, assisted by Michael Berry, the left side linebacker. So Sterling is back in and healthy again, and that's good news for Furman. The defense of Georgia Southern has really uh, got to pick up their end of the bargain now. The offense has made some adjustments, moved the football, got some points. Now it's going to be up to their defense to stop Furman, get the ball back. Second down, six yards to go. And there's goes Sterling. Yeah, he's back and healthy with a healthy gain to the 49-yard line. Randall Boone, the free safety, was able to run him down. Watch this hole just open up in the middle of the line. Linebacker overruns the play, and again splits the gap, the bubble we're talking about. Sterling goes untouched well into the secondary. That's just bad up front play by Georgia Southern. They're just not taking care of their own holes on that defense. Remember, Furman's offense 
has run at will tonight thus far. They've only stopped themselves inside the Georgia Southern 20 yard line. And the handoff this time up the middle to Billy Stockdale. His first carry of the night in the Georgia Southern Territory at the 43. Terry Young made the stop. Stockdale out of Pontiana, Alabama, a sophomore. This is what Irk Russell was afraid of. We talked about it last night, just running right at him, overpowering him, taking advantage of all those bubbles, those stacked linebackers that open those natural gaps if they don't come up quick to make the play. Frankie DeBusk with an outstanding first half of play, short of the interception by Whitley in the end zone. 331 and counting in the third, second and two. Pitch to back row. It could be wide open if he can get outside. Down to the 25 yard line. Everett Sharp trying to strip him with the ball, finally holding down. Again, the option ability, which is somewhat of a surprise of Frankie DeBus. I mean, we heard about uh, Raymond Gross, but DeBus was down to the very end before he makes a great pitch to Bagwell. It was his effective execution of the play that uh, got Bagwell open around the end. Russell can only watch a Furman offense that has been very difficult for his defense to throttle so far tonight. First and ten. Bobby Doherty to the 21. Ball pops free, but the whistle had already blown. Giff Smith made the stop for the Eagle defense. I'm impressed with the different numbers we're calling here. You get a little Sterling and some Bagwell, and then Bobby Doherty comes in. Furman really mixing it up in the third quarter here. Again, it's the line of scrimmage that they're dominating. Watch them open up that hole with two linemen, 64, Elton Bailey and Faye Cowan, number 66, just turned their men opposite directions, opened up a huge hole. Second down, six. Bagwell dots the eye. And he gets it cracked down at the line of scrimmage by Terry Young. 212 and counting. And DeBus, the sophomore from Greenville, Tennessee, coached by Tim Sorrell. He's very proud of this youngster. He missed the first three games with shoulder injuries. And he said it was, he just wanted to do too much too soon. In fact, he was four for 25 and had four interceptions in the Marshall game. And he really turned it around after that. Third down and five. It was the first Marshall game, by the way. They later would beat Marshall in the playoff. And the toss to Backwell to the wide side of the field. And he's inside the 10 to the 8-yard line. Rodney Oglesby makes the stop, the cornerback, with Everett Sharp, the linebacker. Again, they got Georgia Southern playing soft, playing pass. They went with a down-the-line option. The bus runs it again well. Fake to the fullback. See the pitch. There was one man on two. Number 95, Giff Smith, could not take care of both of those outside portions of the option. But watch the key block. Number 87, Greg Key, on number 49, Randall Boone. He goes downfield and takes him out completely. First down goal, Furman. Sterling down to the five-yard line. Michael Berry, the linebacker, along with Daryl Hendricks inside to make the stop. Second time we've seen that formation, Tim. It's really an unbalanced formation to the right side. They're trying to overload it and get one man advantage, which really will help on the option. That time they hand it to the fullback. They'll come back and come around there with the option off that series. Jimmy Satterfield looks on as a sophomore quarterback brings up his troops to the five-yard line. Second and goal. shoulder Dwight Sterling comes in healthy and finishes off this drive that fullback trap up the middle and look who gets trapped right there the linebacker gets cut down right through the middle and it's just a walk in by the fullback you get knocked to the ground like that that opens it up right up the middle for the fullback and just you know walking the dog he used to call it they go in that easy right now they're walking Sterling off the field right now 
Boy, now you talk about what a national title game means. That's how much it means. He's had the problems. He can't. He's come back once. It may just be cramps. He's smiling. So when that happens, a lot of times it hurts at the point of the cramping. Then it'll let up, and you'll come back, and then all of a sudden it'll come back on you again. On crutches earlier in the week on Monday and Tuesday. Couldn't practice until Friday. Had a lot to do with that drive. Dwight Sterling. The extra point is good. And with 38 seconds left in the third quarter, the Paladins make good on this try. They lead by 11. You're looking at a full-time running back and full-time athlete at Furman. Dwight Sterling, he's also on the wrestling team and the track team, runs a 4-7-40 on crutches earlier in the week. 12 rushes for 70 yards. A good part of that terrain taken in on that last drive. And that scoring drive, by the way, for the Paladins of Furman, netting 80 yards, 429 off the clock, capped by the five-yard touchdown run by the Hampered, but yet starring Sterling from Furman. <laughs> well, I tell you, Jim, when we started that drive, we said, hey, it's time for Georgia Southern's defense to uh, play up to their end of the bargain. Well, obviously they didn't, and Furman at that time capitalized on one of their good drives. They had drives all night long, just hadn't been able to capitalize. That time they stayed with their staple when they got down there. That's just running straight at that Eagle 7 defense. And the onus now on Georgia Southern on this next drive. Carl Miller back deep, taking in the kick of the five. Boy, big time is pumped up after that 80-yard drive. I'd say so. Billy Stockdale down there to make the stop for the Paladins. Watch number 61 on this trap. This is a touchdown play. David Adams. Quick fullback trap. Watch him right there. Just well, really didn't have to. The, the, the play itself took uh, the defensive lineman out of the play, but he just cleaned him out, moved him further along, gave Sterling even a bigger hole. It appeared to me that Sterling was hurting as he dove into the end zone. From the 14, first down. Gross. Trouble with the pitch and more trouble from the Paladin defense. Kevin Kendrick, the first to get there. William Hall, the free safety, would also come in to polish up with Kelly Fletcher. Fletcher does a great job here. He's on the outside. He has the option. Stays there. He's got the quarterback and is able to take the quarterback. It's called hang and then break. You hang for the quarterback. You break on the pitch. He did it perfectly. Time running out here in the third quarter. Fast-paced game in Pocatello, Idaho. In 85, when these two teams last met, 44-42 was the score and a comeback win for Tracy Hamm and the Georgia Southern Eagles. One quarter remains. Irk Russell will need a repeat in 88. He's down. start the fourth quarter here for the NCAA Division I AA National Championship in Pocatello, Idaho. Georgia Southern trailing Furman 17-6. Tim Brando and Stan White with you. We're happy you joined us. Gross running the option. Stopped again by Craven. Boy, the tackle has had a big game. Senior out of Boone, North Carolina. Just can't emphasize enough how well Furman has played their position, stayed at home. Again, that time, the counter option, they did everything they could to get the Furman defense to flow the wrong way. They did the quick motion, and they stopped and came back the other way on the counter play. They're just staying right with their responsibilities, and they are shutting down that Georgia Southern flex bone. Donnie Allen is coming to the game. Three receivers now set to the right side of the field. Gross looking long for Tony Bowser. Covered nicely that time by Pat Turner and William Hall. And once again, this not being a part of the Georgia Southern offensive scheme makes it hard to come from 11 down, doesn't it? Yeah, but he threw the ball about 65 yards in the air there. He does have the arm to bring mm -hmm. him back if he can get somebody open. Look at that. 0 and 2 when trailing after three quarters, Georgia Southern. Uh, of course, on the flip side of that, they're 12 and 0 when they're leading. Yep. After three quarters. So you know they love to play ahead, and they're used to that. Harvin will punt it away from his end zone. Pat Turner back deep. He'll have some room here, although it may close in a hurry. 
Michael Berry. What a maneuver downfield. To stop him at the 45-yard line. Well, I'll be off to Lexington, Kentucky to meet up with Dick Vitale as a Tuesday night college basketball doubleheader comes your way. Indiana against Kentucky. A couple of border state teams meeting. And then Ohio State, the Buckeyes of Gary Williams, to take on the Gamecocks of South Carolina. And that is a team that has shown well tonight already. First down and 10. Just a minute gone here in the fourth quarter. DeBusk from his 45 with an eye set. He's looking long for Lipscomb again. Intercepted almost by Randall Boone. He had it in midair, and then I think Lipscomb helped knock that one away as he hit the turf. Well, Randall Boone learned from the opening play of the game. They tried to get Lipscomb with his speed matched up on the safety. But Boone gives him about a five-yard cushion on the play. Look at him just waiting back there for Lipscomb. He goes up. Boone, number 49, has the football, but he's got to come down with it. When he hits the ground, it pops out incomplete. Good throw by Frankie DeBusk. He's getting the ball out there. You're hoping to get interference or get a, 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 a completion. Your man can go up and get the football. Luckily, he didn't get intercepted there. Second and ten. DeBusk looking for some help finds it himself inside the 50 to the 48 Darren Alford there to make the stop the bus thought uh, that was going to be a handoff and Bowery didn't so he took it and turned it into an option play you see the middle linebacker Daryl Hendricks getting cut off as he got caught up in the line of scrimmage in the mix he doesn't get the flow it's a good job right there getting away from Gibbs Smith, number 95, making something out of a busted play. Puts him in a good third down and short situation. Third and four with the ball inside the 49-yard line. The bus sacked behind the line. Everett Sharp getting help from Charlie Waller, I beg your pardon. The guard coming through. Everett Sharp was blitzing that time, but Waller made the stop, 67 and white. Well, Georgia Southern comes up with a big play defensively to stop the Furman drive. It's going to get to a Raymond Gross to turn that offense around, get them moving. Bruce Light will punt it away for Furman. Rodney Ogles be back deep for the Eagles. 12-38 and counting. And with an offense like Georgia Southern's, they need to make good here. And there's the block. Giles again. His second block punt of the year. Touchdown, Eagles. Designated blocker does it again. That's his fourth of the year, second tonight. That one he took right off the foot of the punter. And he was there when the ball was there. He takes it, picks it up, and goes in for the score. Remember last week against Eastern Kentucky? He blocked the kick that turned that game around in the second half. He blocks the kick in this fourth quarter. And who knows? That may turn this game around. Blocked extra point, blocked kicks, blocked punts. Number two for him tonight. One a field goal. This one a punt. And they're going to be going for two here. 17 to 12. That'll put him within the field goal range of tying the football game. Joe Ross, the lone setback. Thompson in motion. Gross rolling in the direction of Thompson and in trouble. Worsham is open and he overthrows him. He caught him about a second or so late. Otherwise, he would have had the deuce. 12 24 to play, and Giles has turned this into a close game. And watch number 10 and White again, right side of the screen. And yeah, watch Mark Giles. I mean, he comes through and takes it right off the foot of Bruce Like. He's there. I mean, he could almost, it's almost like a lateral. It bounces twice. He turns around, picks it up, and has an escort into the end zone. That turns this game around. That offense could not get moving for Georgia Southern. So their special teams made the big play. And now you look back at all those missed opportunities that Furman had. They're saying, geez, we've dominated this game, and it's 17 to 12. The freshman from Marietta, Georgia, 
in his first full season as a starter, having a big game. Tonight's game is being brought to you by Isotoner Gloves for Men. The perfect fit, because they're the perfect fit. And by Budweiser. Beechwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. Here's the kick. Pat Turner back deep, and it will go into the end zone for a touchback. And there's Giles, the man of the hour right now, a freshman out of Warner Robins, Georgia, a red shirt freshman. <laughs> They'll love having another year of eligibility with that young guy. He's gotten it done with special teams tonight. Storyline, Pocatello Giles, two block kicks, one for a touchdown. Georgia Southern with nothing in the air. Furman with plenty. Rushing yards. Furman getting it done and missed opportunities in the first half. Really the calling card to what is only a five-point lead. DeBus brings up his troops at the 20 for first down. Checking off. The option is snowed under. Tim Brown along with Whitley cutting through, and we've got a marker down. Strong safety Kevin Whitley came through that time. And they'll only add insult to injury with this call. Crack back block for the down the line option. Hit him in the back again. Boy, Eric Russell's team just keeps on keeping on, don't they? They get it done somehow. We talked about the bending but not mm -hmm. breaking. They've bent and bent. They've given up well over 300 yards. We just looked at. Mm -hmm. But they've only given up 17 points, and they're still in the football game. He came over here in 1981. Flipping on the offense. Half the distance to the goal. Repeat first down. Left Georgia when Vince Dooley elected to stay and be the head coach at Georgia. He had been rumored for the Auburn job at one time in 1980. And he left in an 82, began a club team that would become a two-time national champion in the 80s. Bobby Doherty out to the 15 and beyond. Darren Alford there to make the stop. They haul him in around the 16 to 17 yard line. Right here is the key play for the Georgia Southern defense. They got him second and 10 plus, second about 14 to go. You want to keep him in that situation, not give him the 8, 9, 10 yards that gives him the opportunity to make the first down. Doherty now coming out of the game. Bagwell enters at the tailback spot now. Behind Billy Stuckdale, number 33 at fullback. DeBuzz. Tripped up again by Charlie Waller. Number 67 has made a couple of big plays. Knows how to dance, too. Well, that's what we said. That was a big play for them. Now they got him third and long. This is where they can make the big play defensively. Man, you're thinking third and 10 plus. You're thinking of coming up with an interception, a sack, causing a fumble. Look for 25 Lipscomb here or maybe the tight end. What do you think? Well, they went to their wide open offense. Look for Bagwell come out of the backfield, maybe number 32. The bus needs some help. There is Bagwell, and he just missed it. Oh, and he was there too. Overthrown, but oh, so very little. What made the play is the bus bought time by scrambling and allowed Bagwell to come out. He had man-to-man -man coverage on Michael Berry, the linebacker, but he's beat him by five, eight yards. Ball just off his fingertips. He makes a valiant try with the dive, but just can't quite come down with it. He is one of their leading receivers. He's done a great job out of the backfield. Now they got a kick again, though. You'll think they're looking for number 10. That play pretty much analyzes the game for them. Near misses. The near misses inside the 20 and scoring opportunities. And that first down would have been a huge one with just over 10 minutes to play. Another near block punt. Oglesby at the 45. Back down at the 48-yard line. Tim Wilkerson may have gotten a hand on that one. Mike Kiernan made the stop. And we'll be back to Pocatello right after this. Jimmy Satterfield, the head coach, talking offense right now, as he always does, putting the defense in the hand of Bobby Johnson. 17-12, our score. And watch now, like, punting the ball from the end zone stand, 
Watch how far he drops the ball as he approaches. That's a real low drop, and it takes a while to get there. Allows them that one extra step to block the punt. He's lucky to get that off. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it got through the two uh, special teams players for Georgia Southern. Luckily for uh, like it did, though. First down, so very important. Three for 18 on conversions of four yards or more. And there's a fumble again. Boy, Gross has had a number of mishandles with his star center Dennis Franklin tonight. Well, the star center Dennis Franklin's been having his hands full with Allen Edwards, too. Maybe that's why he's having uh, a little problem getting the ball up. He wants to get off a little bit quicker. Remember they said he's the fastest guy. He can snap. He can step at the same time. Or maybe he's trying to step before he snaps with Allen uh, Edwards uh, doing the job that he's doing tonight. Second and 12. Play action fake. Gross running out of time. Looking for help from Carl Miller incomplete. Miller was there. Gross zipped that one pretty good. You know, a lot of people say that Georgia Southern, the only difference in this team and the ones from 85 and 86 is that Ham could unload the ball just as well as he could throw the ball. The few times we've seen Gross really throw it, he's thrown it with some authority, although he has been ineffective in the air. Well, yeah, that should have been caught. I mean, Carl Miller did a great job of coming back to help his quarterback on the scramble. Gross caught him out of the corner of his eye, saw him breaking open, threw it right to him. But uh, Carl Miller just knocked him out of the football. Third down and 12. Gross sacked by Dean Williams. The sophomore from Atlanta, Georgia, number 55, coming through there. Jimmy Satterfield and staff coming up with some offense as Georgia Southern has to go to punt formation. Again, you get them third and long. That's not where they want to be. They're not a passing team when the other team knows they're going to pass. And the punt, Pat Turner calling for a fair catch back at the 13-yard line. If it becomes a game of field position with 9.22 to play, you can credit the Furman defense for getting the job done on that last series, look at their dominance throughout the year. Scoring defense, second in rushing defense, fourth in total defense, passing defense off a bit, but they certainly haven't allowed much tonight. No, they haven't. They've done a good job in uh, playing their positions. They're well-schooled, they're fundamentally sound, and they don't take those false steps, not even against this uh, flex bone misdirection offense. Patrick Parr made the stop. Carrying the ball was Ron Sherwood, reserve fullback, just coming into the game, number 41 in purple. He comes out of the game now, and Billy Stockdale enters at the fullback spot on second and eight. Stockdale. Up to the 16-yard line, a bevy of white jerseys on hand to make the stop for Georgia Southern. 8.38 and counting, 17-12, the Paladins. And they'd love to keep this drive alive, so that makes this third down conversion even that much more important for that man, Jim Satterfield. Georgia Southern has really uh, picked up the tempo at the line of scrimmage. They're firing off the ball, they're playing their gaps. Their linebackers are stepping up a little tighter, cutting off those bubbles, playing much better these last couple times. Third down five. The bust. In trouble and down. Alford again. Second sack of this night, 17 on the year. He broke James Carter's career record for sacks. James Wildman Carter, who was injured, unable to take part this year. Like will have to punt it away. Remember that low drop. This time he's standing in his end zone. Like gets it away, gets some distance, and we have a whistle and a marker down. I don't think they got it off before the 25-second clock had expired. Well, that'll make life even more difficult for Life, who's already 
and a nightmarish second half. This time he will have to punt it from the end line of the end zone. He got off a good punt. Well into uh, well past the midfield. Yeah, he had Oglesby backing up. In fact, he was still in retreat when the marker came down. Now it's probably a good time to fake you're going to block it, and everybody's going to be bunched in mm -hmm. for the punt team trying to protect, and you should get a good return out of it. Jim Gerard is the special teams coach. He's got to be proud of the job his Georgia Southern team has done thus far. A concern, Jimmy Satterfield. Here they come. Low punt, low trajectory. Oglesby with room. Down at the 40-yard line, Tom Griffith made the stop, and that's a happy punter because he know he got he, he knows that he was able to get rid of it. I tell you what, Georgia Southern will take it right there inside the 40, going in, down five points. The way they've been dominated tonight, I think, mm -hmm. is a proper word to use, but. They've hung in there, hung tough, and now they got a chance to win the football game in the fourth quarter. Sometimes you win championships when you don't play your best, but still know how to win. And another mishandled snap. And Gross again recovers it at the line of scrimmage. I just have to believe it's because of the uh, play of the nose guards. It's really gotten out of hand this late in the season, this late in the game. He just didn't get the football. It looked like the ball got up to him that time. He just didn't grab onto it. But again, you see where the you see where the center was when the ball hit mm -hmm. the quarterback's hands. He was gone already, right. which means his hands were out there in the open, which is a tough exchange. He wants to get his hands on the center when he gets that football. Second and ten, play action fake, and he'll tuck it in. Gross to the 35-yard line. 6:34 in counting now. Full complement of timeouts. In case you're wondering, for both teams down the stretch. Another third down play in this uh, offense. They're almost better just running the rollout mm -hmm. with the quarterback running. You know, put an extra blocker in front of them off this uh, four wide receiver offense. Only one out of seven. And here goes Gross looking for worship. He has it. And he has a first down to the 25-yard line. The possession receiver, Ross Worsham, Julius Dixon, the fastest player on this Paladin team, number 44, made the stop, a shoestring tackle. Nice throw. He rolls to his right, stops five steps, and throws the hitch pattern wide open. Just enough for the first down. Worsham is an outstanding blocker as well, and that's what you need from wide receivers in this flex bone offense that Georgia Southern utilizes. Gross looking for Belzer at the 11. First down. Could it be a repeat of 1985? Well, the Eagles hope so. There's nothing wrong with that young man's arm. He can put the ball on the line all the way. That's, again, that's a 30-yard throw for a 10, 12-yard gain. Uh, from one hash mark to the other, and he put it right on the chest of Tony Belzer. Furman led Georgia Southern 28 to 6 at one point in 85, before Tracy Ham brought them back to a 44-42 win. This time the option throws, fumble. Furman's got it. Down at the two-yard line. Raymond Gross. I'll be thinking about that one for a long, long time. Again, on the option, it's high risk. You have the ball out. Watch him one hand. He's running through there. Look at that ball out. It just hits from the side. Ball pops out. Furman, again, bends and bends, but does not break. It appeared to be T Taylor Quarles that was on top of it. And there you see number 57, Kevin Kendrick, coming off the field. Hard really to tell who did come up on top of that one with the fumble recovery. Swinging the ball like that, though, in scoring territory. Paul Craven made the hit that forced the fumble. The ball at the two, five and a half to play in the fourth quarter. Stockfield, first down with a 12 and beyond. 
Well, that's a huge play for Furman. Backed up on their own two-yard line. If they can force them to punt from their own end zone, they're going to get great field position. But this trap play has worked all night for Furman. Again, David Adams, number 61. Watch the right there, the trap block. Just turns out number 67, Charlie Waller. And Billy Stockdale has the huge gap in the middle. Kevin Whitley appears to be the injured eagle. We'll check on his status when we return. Three to play. Tim Brando and Stan White with you. The Furman Paladins clinging to a five-point lead with 5.22 and counting. Wade Sexton, by the way, came up with that recovery of the gross fumble. Sexton, the senior from Lake City, Tennessee. A huge, huge fumble recovery just moments ago. First down, 10, Furman. Stockdale again. Breaking tackle after tackle to the 30-yard line. Randall Boone finally knocked him down. Right back to the stick it right to you type offense. The fullback play, just a base play. Big hole, number 95, Giff Smith hit him from the side. Stockdale too strong for the side tackle. It Again, the middle linebacker, number 43, Daryl Hendricks, just gets cut off by the center, Steve Dugan. Good block on him, but he had the angle. First down, 10, Furman. Bagwell gets it this time. Runs right into Tim Brown and company. No gain that time. Stay with the fullback the way he's been running. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just keep handing it to him. Well, it's, it was Sterling early. They've had to go to Stockdale because Dwight Sterling has been injured in this game a couple of times. He's got his jersey off yeah. now, so he's not going to be uh, back tonight. Jimmy Satterfield, four minutes away from his first national championship in his third season since taking over for Dick Sheridan after the 85 season when they came so very close to a national championship. Second and nine. Stockdale again, this time the hole closed quickly. Tim Brown again, and Giff Smith combined on the stop. Well, three uh, 40 left in the game, Tim. Third down and eight. They need to stop him right here. Third and seven. They need to stop. Defensively, this is the play of the game for the Georgia Southern defense. Out of an eye formation. Play action counter. They go to Bagwell. Short of the first down. So the counter option, two yards shy of the first down to the 38. Give Smith again there to make the stop on the third down play. Well, give Furman's offense some credit. They started this drive from their two, inched it out to the 38-yard line, and with the problems that have beset the kicking game of Furman tonight, that's very important. Hey, you wonder about that play call. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, you don't want to make a mistake, but one first down may be the football game. They go for the counter option back to the weak side. And they do have an opening here. But number 19 comes up, makes a good overfield tackle. Rodney Oglesby on John Bagwell. That's the play of the game for them in the open field for Georgia Southern. That forces them to punt. Georgia Southern takes a timeout. Save time for their offense. Memories for Jimmy Satterfield and for Furman linebacker Jeff Blankenship. The championship loss to Georgia Southern was especially tough to swallow because of how the Eagles scored their final touchdown. The last pass that they scored on was you know, right over my head and right through the defender's hands. It was a perfect pass and a few seconds left in the game. And it, it, it took a lot of breath out of us and it, it was a big blow to us. 14 seconds left. Third and 10 for Georgia Southern. got into the end zone for the touchdown and Jimmy Satterfield was the offensive coordinator on that team oh how they remember still 312 remaining for Furman to come up with a national championship three years hence White 
Gets it away. A nice tight spiral. Sending Ogilvy to, to the 15. Down to the 22-yard line. Bruce Like got it done that time. Freshman from Hartwell, Georgia. First scholarship punter that Jimmy Satterfield ever came up with. And now with 3.01 to play, Georgia Southern has 77 yards between them and a third national championship inside of four years for a program only five years old under Eric Russell. From the 23, Ross to the 28-yard line. Jeff Blankenship made the stop. They got to hurry up. They can't afford to uh, take too much time in the huddle at this point. Let the clock run. They got to go with a. They are going with a quick huddle. Belzer up at the top of your screen. Wide receiver they'll utilize often. Gross looking for Carl Miller and he dropped it. And it was perhaps the Dolph Berman says so. Wade Sexton has the football. The officials really scooped it up off the turf. Incomplete. And third down coming up. Well, let's take a look at it. Carl Miller is the man. He dropped the ball earlier. This time he almost drops it right to Sexton, but the ball hits the ground. Didn't quite get underneath a good call by the officials. That would have been game time. Mm -hmm. Third down and six. 2.31 left to play in Georgia Southern down by five. Worsham is free. Sexton knocked it away. Well, it was so wide open, they decided let's go back and run the same play. This time we'll put Worsham over there because he's the guy that always catches the football, but Wade Sexton, he said, hey, I'm not going to let you have it twice in a row. Like Shot in front, he just almost came to the interception there. Fourth down, they're going to have to go for it. Georgia Southern with two timeouts remaining. Furman has three. There's Bobby Johnson, the defensive coach, shouting out instructions, hoping it's the final time he has to do that. Fourth and six. Gross. Out pattern. Incomplete. Nearly picked off by Julius Dixon. That may be it, folks. 222 to play. And Irk Russell's troops are down. They only have two timeouts remaining. Jimmy Satterfield's team has outstanding field position to work with in the waning moments here. Well, they Ross were confused Worsham, here. Yeah, Ross Worsham ran straight down the field, and Raymond Gross throws the out pattern, almost throws it right to Julius Dixon. There's no receiver there. Obviously, there was a miscommunication. Ball at the 27-yard line now for Furman. the middle Stockdale again boy they have gotten so much out of that fullback position tonight both from Sterling and Stockdale Michael Berry made the tackle for Georgia Southern well when they're running up the middle on an even front that is nobody over the center you got to start pinching your tackles to take care of that trap play they just haven't been able to close off that hole now Furman really is two yards away from a national championship you see the timeouts remaining and you see the time running out and Furman will call a timeout right now. Perhaps unsure of the play, you see Jimmy Satterfield's reaction. He said, why he called the timeout? He's about to find out. Jimmy Satterfield joined Art Baker's staff many years ago, and he had in mind, of course, a national title. It's taken that long as an assistant and a few years as a head coach to be a couple of yards away, and that's what they are right now. Second down to Furman from the 20-yard line of Georgia Southern. Why not give it to the fullback and look at Alford there to make the stop, dragging him down behind the line of scrimmage. Billy Stockdale was stopped after at least a two-yard loss. 142 remaining in the game, and Alford is limping. That's the one thing you didn't want to do, to lose any yards in that play. As a fullback, you should have just gone straight into the line, taken maybe your six inches or your foot or whatever, but not bounce outside and risk losing some yards, because now it goes back to third and five. 
They're looking for a turning point in tonight's game. This very well could have been it. Raymond Gross with 5.30 remaining, taking the snap, running the option play, carrying it like a loaf of bread. Fletcher, Kelly Fletcher, makes the hit, the defensive end, and Wade Sexton, number 23, the free safety, gets the recovery, and that kept Jim Satterfield's team ahead by five with the ball at the two-yard line. And since then, the Paladins have had their guns loaded. They've continued to hang on to the ball with consistent drives off tackle and up the middle. All night they've moved the ball consistently. Mm -hmm. They haven't always executed any points uh, from the ends of their drive, but they've held the ball quite a bit tonight. The lion's share of the time. Lester Eford, one of the many Georgia Southern Eagles looking on, perhaps seeing their national championship hopes fade away. Ron Sherwood, number 41 in at fullback on third and six. Sherwood gets it. That's the play that's been so successful. It gets them back to the 19-yard line. It appears that they are at least two yards shy of the first down. Fourth down, forthcoming. Jimmy Satterfield will have a decision to make. Well, a field goal puts him up 20 to 12, eight points. Mm -hmm. But they've had a lot of blocks. Remember Mr. Giles, NFL game day coming up. Tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, Chris Berman, Tom Jackson, Pete Axtell, John Saunders has been with us tonight in a studio host role. We'll join them again. He's a busy guy for NFL primetime. And then Mike Patrick and Joe Theismann will be on hand at Candlestick Park as the 49ers meet the Rams. Furman looking for its 400th win in school history, and all Georgia Southern can do is wait and see what happens with the time they have remaining. Raymond Gross hoping for one more try. They're going to go for it here. Fourth down in about one. At the 19-yard line with 134 to play, the Division I-AA National Championship hangs in the balance. The Paladins of Furman, who've controlled this game offensively all night long with a five-point lead, and it comes down to this. Unbalanced left. Stockdale, and I don't know. It appears that he may be shy of the first down. Daryl Hendricks, the linebacker, and who better than the junior out of Nahunta, Georgia, to make the critical tackle on fourth down. And you see the response of the Georgia Southern defense. Yep, he's short, no doubt about it. Georgia Southern will have one more opportunity with a minute and a half left. Jimmy Satterfield wants the measurement. You know, interestingly, they took the timeout on a second and two play. Satterfield didn't want the timeout called. The play they got after the timeout was the fullback going wild and losing three yards. That cost them an opportunity at closing this game out. Yeah, and you wonder about kicking the field goal. You sure'd like to be eight points up knowing the worst you could do if everything went wrong would be end up in a tie game and go to overtime. Remember, though, Giles, he's had those blocks tonight, both in field goals and punt situations. I'm sure that was in Satterfield's head. 17-12, Raymond Gross does get one more try. Looking for some help. He'll run it this time. Sexton comes up. Helps escort him out of bounds at the 22-yard line. You wonder now what they may do offensively because as we've said so often, this is not Georgia Southern's forte. Moving in big chunks of yardage in a short span of time. Four out of 15 grosses numbers for just 51 yards. Yeah, they're going to do it. They're going to do it on his running ability to buy time for people to get open or his scrambling ability upfield. He's looking for Worsham, and he's in trouble and down at the 17-yard line, and Paul Craven again is there to make the stop. Clock ticking, 106 and counting. Jimmy Satterfield still with his offense. He puts it all in Bobby Johnson's hands as defensive coordinator. Gross, Belser's open in the middle of the field, goes to Frankie Johnson. 
Johnson bounces off would-be tacklers and has the first down. 46 seconds remaining. Georgia Southern with one timeout left. Again, if they're going to do it, exactly what we said, he's going to have to do it with his athletic ability, scrambling, buying time for somebody to come open. Clock stopped for the chains to move. Still 46 seconds left. Gross. Intercepted. By Blankenship. And there it is. A national championship at long last. to end a great college career. The all-time leading tackler at Furman. Two interceptions tonight for one deflection. Now this one, he reads the play, gets to his hook zone, just waits for the ball, makes a good break on it. And that's the cap off a college career with the national championship and the big play defensively after making so many big plays throughout your career. Jeff Blankenship. 35 seconds remain now for the Furman Paladins. The bus using as much time as possible and sitting on it. Georgia Southern with the one timeout remaining. Choosing not to utilize it here. And there's Blankenship. The pass went over his head, you'll recall, to Frankie Johnson in 85 for the touchdown to win it from Tracy Ham. And in his mind, in the minds of his many teammates, justice has been served. Burke Russell. Perhaps his last game as head coach, but what a proud tradition he has begun in Statesboro. The Furman Paladins are the national champions of Division I AA college football. Division 1 AA championship is complete, and at long last, the Furman Paladins, so very close in years past, have the national title. And Jimmy Satterfield, the head coach, proud for his team and his quarterback, Frankie DeBust. Look at the acceleration there. Isn't that what it's all about? And the coach is with us now. Congratulations, Jimmy. Thank you. Our guys did a fantastic job. Our coaches and players have worked hard all year long. It's just great to see them accomplish something like this. Coach, uh, your offense did a great job tonight, but I guess it was fitting that your defense came up with the big plays to win this game for you. Well, Jeff Blankenship is fitting that he made that interception. He's played great for four years. He's leading tackler and had a super interception. Looked like we tried to give away with that punt block, but our players played fantastic. He moves the ball on offense, did a lot of things we wanted to do. And didn't play real conservative. He wanted to move the ball, make them play everything we had to do. Jimmy, congratulations on a great year, and the proud tradition of Furman remains. They're in beautiful South Carolina in Greenville. Congratulations again. Thank you. All right, Stan White, final comments on what was a, a great football game. And there is a, a youngster right there, Dwight Sterling, who had much to do with this victory back on crutches as he was at the beginning of the week. Powerful running attack. We said they'd go right at him. They did. Again, though, the defense, the big plays, that's what wins championship games. Furman just a little better on defense today than Georgia Southern was. In fact, a lot better. Mm -hmm. They just uh, came up with big plays time after time, and they won the national championship for Furman. All right, so the national champions are the Paladins. Have gun, will travel. Well, it will <laughs> all the way back to Greenville, South Carolina. Our final again, 17 to 12. Now, don't forget, ESPN's coverage of college football will continue in December with three exciting bowl games. December 29th, Florida and Illinois square off in the All-American Bowl. December 30th, it's Barry Sanders and Oklahoma State against Wyoming in the SeaWorld Holiday Bowl. And on January 1, the Georgia Bulldogs meet the Spartans of Michigan State in the Mazda Gator Bowl. Tonight's National Championship Division 1AA capped off late when Jeff Blankenship, the senior who had remembered the pass in 85, got a chance at a pass in 88. And the results this time far different. A national championship for Jimmy Satterfield and his bunch from Greenville. They are the national champions. 
For Stan White, I'm Tim Brando saying so long from Pocatello, where the celebration has only just begun. Thank you. Well, it's been a weekend to remember for the Furman Paladins. The school won the big championship victory over Georgia Southern last night. Night Watch reporter Nora Shimoda talked to fans as they arrived home today. The long flight back from Idaho after the big game didn't appear to take its toll on the proud Paladins or their fans. The sweet taste of victory must have been like a jolt of caffeine as they claimed their championship bragging rights. That's what it's That's all about. Nice. Number one in the nation. Nice. Number one. Around town, cars sported victory signs and the mighty purple and white flags. Some churchgoers like Anna Quattlebaum wore the purple dress of success. Anna, what did you think of the game last night? I loved every bit of it. Very proud of the players. It even became part of some church sermons. The color purple is used to, on the um, altar in front, and he said that this has been going on for 800 years and that it's special for Furman, too. He's Balloons flew high in some restaurants for the Furman victory. <laughs> Nora Shimoda, TV7 Eyewitness News, Greenville. Well, coming up, Fred will have highlights from the champion gang. No bowl game for Furman, but they got something much better. Their first national championship late last night, a 17-12 win over Georgia Southern, a sweet mail of revenge for the Paladins. Bob Juback has more. Intercepted by Blankenship. A national championship at long last. Three long years. Ever since 1985, when Furman was so close, when Georgia Southern went so far. Now the crown belongs to the Paladins. Makes up 85, because you know we had that sick feeling after 85, that gut feeling, you know, losing the close game. And so we had something to prove coming out today. And I tell you, it's wonderful. But it's more than just a case of revenge. The 17 to 12 win over Southern is a great example of determination. As a team that most predicted would fail, was determined not to. Touchdown! But the Paladins nearly left Idaho without a win as the Eagles make it close at the end. Of the year. Touchdown, Eagles! Well, I think we did that for the fans, just to make it interesting. We should have won the game easy there, and we moved the ball all over the field and had the ball down there, but we didn't get it in easy because they were a good team, and but it's just a fantastic effort to win the game. And the greatest feeling in the world doesn't end here in Pocatello as the celebration continues all the way home to Carolina. On the plane home, the emotions run high. And at the jet port, several hundred fans hold. They stand in the dark to welcome home the champions. And like the seconds on the scoreboard clock, the bitter memories of 85 fantastically disappear. I bet you don't even think about 85 anymore. Heavens no, it's gone. <laughs> it took three years and dozens of battles, but finally Georgia Southern goes home number two, and Furman comes home number one. The Paladins are national champions. At the Greenville Spartanburg Jetport, Bob Chuback, TV7 Eyewitness Sports. This is Bob kind of limping home, isn't it? <laughs> it was an agonizing game to watch. It was for two reasons. Number one was the hour. I mean, the game went until after 1 o'clock last night. The other reason was that Furman clearly dominated the game, but they had about two or three turnovers and had a blocked field goal, and it just looked like that they would outplay them and find a way to lose, but the defense came through and they found a way to win. And congratulations, sir. It was a great game. Really? And get, Bob should get some sleep <laughs> <laughs> for a couple of days. Hopefully, maybe. hopefully. <laughs> Thanks very much, Fred. Furman Football 88, the Jimmy Satterfield Show. Only at Vince Perrone's can you get a championship sandwich like this right here. And we got our number one fan here, Vince Perrone. He sold a bunch of tickets for those playoff games, and he's excited about next season ticket sales. Let's not talk about Vince's. Let's talk about Furman. Furman is great. If everybody out there will go ahead and order their two-season tickets right now and say, bill me on it before June 1st, show the acknowledged receipt to Vince's, and we'll give you one free dinner with every ticket order for two. How about that? Hello everybody and what you're looking at 
is the National Football Championship Trophy for Division I 2A. And I think in the last 22 hours, everybody that's connected with the Furman football team has had a chance to hold that trophy, including the coach of the national champions, Coach Jimmy Satterfield. How does it feel, Coach? Well, it's fantastic. Uh, we got back early this morning and got a little nap. And I woke up and I went in and saw Ann sitting in there and I said, you know, I had the wildest dream. And, but it was real. <laughs> <laughs> I remember yesterday, right after the ball game, you said it's going to take a while to sink in. Has it sunk in yet? Well, I don't know if it'll ever sink in. It was just fantastic for these players and coaches. They work so hard and be able to accomplish something. Just super people and seem like we may have wanted just a little bit more. What a magical season it's been, hasn't it? It's been kind of like a storybook, and I thought that uh, carriage would turn into a pumpkin, but it never did. Very good. They won it in Idaho. Had to go 2,500 miles to do it. The Furman Paladins had to go out there in the Rockies with all the snow, Coach. They've got some great people out there. They were just fantastic. They treated us great, and there's some scenes, and it's great for our kids to get out to go out and look and see some of the sights out there. And there's the whole arena, the Mini Dome in Pocatello, Idaho, and they had a pretty good crowd there. It was a good crowd. They were very enthusiastic, and a lot of them were pulling for Furman. This is the first of the game. They make a trap, and our defense just played super. Allen Edwards, the freshman, started, and they got an All-American center. Bobby Johnson looking at some of the plays. They have been averaging 400 yards a game. They got less than 200 against our defense, just you seeing some of the super plays that we made. We got the ball on offense, and we wanted to open with this play because in 85, we had run that play very successfully, Bobby Lamb, on the options to the right. And we thought that would uh, kind of set that up, and Donald Lipscomb made a good catch and had a big game. On this play here, uh, Bobby had run a lot in 85 and gained a lot of yards on him. We talked so much this year about how the young players have come through, and Donald Lipscomb is a great example of that. Donald Lipscomb from Gaffney has come through all year long. Of course, Allen Edwards here from Spartanburg making a play right there. Just a super play. And uh, Allen has been playing behind Wayne Burr, who got hurt and had to start in this game. And I think the defensive ends played especially well last night. Kelly Fletcher, uh, Roper, they played great. Here's a play by Fletcher. He made academic All-America, and that's just another honor from a, it's a great team. And he has a bunch of stars on his helmet. This is a third down play. Third down play, and Kelly making a good play along with Blankenship and uh, Kevin Kendrick. Kevin Kendrick and Jeff Blankenship have just been super all year long. Their field goal kicker kicked a 55-yarder. He hit some good ones, and that was one and got us down three to nothing. But this is a good drive here. Our offense comes straight back. They really never stopped us much, and uh, I believe that's third and three right there, and Dwight gets about five. Dwight played with a lot of guts. Played hard, as all our players did, and this is a play-action pass to George Quarles. Charles makes a great catch. It's an uh, out, and we were trying to work on their number 49, who we thought maybe been there, wasn't quite as good as some of their other defensive backs. Good protection. Uh, Bagwell, Billy Stockdale, uh, David Adams, Elton Bailey, Fee Cowan, Kyle Lowry, they all played great. Good little bootleg here to John. Frankie just did what he had to do to get the uh, reception. Frankie doing a little improvising there, I think. Frankie played great, hit some good play action passes, and uh, this is one of them. Got sort of chased out of the pocket. Elton couldn't get to that man, but Frankie just kind of loops it out there. Doesn't look pretty, but it gained the first down. Frankie played with a lot of poise, I thought. Wasn't played nervous. Played great. This is a play we put in for this game. It was a combination of two plays, and that was uh, one we uh, tried to get there. Uh, momentum going one way and cut it back. And now Frankie going to the air. Thought this would be a good play. It was off an option where we uh, try to hit a tight end down the middle off an option play, and Frankie executed Greg Key. He might be leading the nation in touchdowns per catch. That was a big catch, and uh, we got on the board, which we wanted to do when we got close. It was a beautiful catch, too. Watch the way he just stretches out for it. Super catch. Uh, Greg made some great catches this year down from Cherokee, Georgia, and just did a super job on that play. Coach Russell doesn't seem to like it too much. Georgia Southern has it here in the second quarter. Langenship makes a super interception, holds on to the ball. We should have scored here. We were very disappointed that we didn't get in early in the game. We were all around the goal line and ended up getting two points. We probably should have had about 30, and we were very disappointed in that. Here's a replay of that same play. I think that number 48 is the one that caught that pass in 85 that ended up beating us, but he didn't get that one. In 85, the ball went over, Jeff said. This he got, time it he doesn't. got that one. This is a good run by Bobby Darty, an inside sweep, and Bobby ran hard all, all day long, as all year, just like John Bagwell and Kennett and all those other guys have. Look at that hole. Super block in there. There's Kyle Lowry, a freshman, David Adams. Uh, Steve Dugan played fantastic. There's Reverend Siderfield getting in on a little bit of the action. 
He certainly had a good time in Idaho, I thought. He's a little calmer there than he probably was in the fourth quarter. Super job here by Kelly. We just, they hurt people with that reverse, and our defense was just ready for it. They had to punt back to you. You get the ball back. You had to be happy with your fan support in Idaho. We had some great fans. This is a new play we put in for this game. is a draw with a tackle pulling, and uh, Bobby gets the, several big gains out of it, and that's another one. That was one of five times you got inside their 30, and you only were able to score two times in the first half. Well, we didn't like that much, but it ended up being enough. Great play by Allen Edwards. Our linebackers, Kevin Kendrick, and Allen just played super. Watch him right there at nose guard. Two guys are blocking him. Good play by our linebackers, Jeff Knox, their runner back, Joe Ross. And then he helps them up. This is a sprint out. They did this very good. Uh, Kelly contains him real good, and that's just great effort by Brian Pitts. Brian Pitts from Clinton has just played super all year long and played almost every play at left tackle. There's your trainer, Bruce Getz, who was very instrumental in this trip. Bruce was instrumental in this victory. Having a good schedule and having someone in charge of it like Bruce eliminates a lot of headaches and helps us have a, a good trip. Georgia Southern's cheerleaders thought they had something going. They didn't. John Bagwell does. Good cut there, and I think Keith Swillen made a block downfield. There's Kyle Lowry, number 74. Uh, Benton Bell, number 89. Here's Keith Swillen. Keith Swillen's six foot, about 205, tight end, and he just plays on sheer heart. And just the kind of guys, a good example of the kind of guys we have that helped us win a national championship. Another great catch. He's made some big catches. He's just a big play guy, and he's a winner. Just like a lot of them we got out there, just winners, and that helps you in a game like this. Same play we've been talking about. Bobby breaks it outside and gets a nice run and run him into the wall down there. Bobby Doherty's family was out in Pocatello, as many of the players' families were. Bobby's dad got sick out there, and we hope he gets well. I think it's just a matter of time to kind of get his equilibrium back, but he had a rough trip, and I know he feels better after we won that game. Glenn Connolly comes in and boots a field goal. It's very important to get that field goal. We've been down there several times and didn't, hadn't gotten anything out of it. We'll get 10 points, and that helped. So it's 10 to 3 right now at this stage. Georgia Southern does have time to get another drive going. They're not really able to do it, though. Well, our defense just played fantastic, and uh, I guess they got six points or so off field goals and we had one blocked punt, but they didn't do much on our defense. Quarterback is kind of slippery, though, isn't he? He runs around a lot, scrambles real good, and he'd beat a lot of people this year by doing that, but our defense was able to contain him and keep him from breaking any long ones. Final play of the first half, and it is incomplete, out of bounds, and you're up on top of Georgia Southern by a score of 10 to 3. Well, he had some time back there to scramble around, but guys like Pat Turner, Julius Dixon, Wade Sexton, William Hall stayed in their zones and played good defense and didn't have anybody open. We've praised the defense so often this year, too, but what an effort last night. They played fantastic. Of course, the offense got some good drives when we needed it. After they would score, we'd take it down and score. And it was just a team effort. Everybody played hard, wanted it real bad, and were able to get it. We know many of you weren't able to watch it if you don't have cable or if you weren't in Idaho, and we have a lot of second-half highlights coming up for you in just a moment as an exciting half of football as you'll ever see. So stay with us on the Jimmy Satterfield Show. Before we take a look at the second half highlights, Coach, what's next for this football team here in the next couple of weeks? What can they do for an encore for the holidays? Well, I think that they're going to have some great holidays. They're going to have a great Christmas, a great New Year's, and come back, and we'll have a big banquet in January. I hope a lot of big uh, fans will come out there that would like the Paladins, and uh, I think they're going to enjoy the spring. I guess this is your present right here, isn't it? Well, our president has been able to win it, and uh, having coaches like we got has just done a super job this year in our defense and offense, and it's just a very rewarding thing. The footage is courtesy from ESPN. Let's take a look at the second half highlights from the Mini Dome in Pocatello, Idaho. Coach Irk Russell is concerned. I guess you have to be concerned, too. It's anybody's ball game. It's anybody's game, and someone asked me if I was worried about the game. I was worried the zeros on the clock. And you get the ball first. We have a pass here to try to... Uh, Get somebody open, they went man coverage, and we couldn't find anybody. Frankie scrambles, and uh, don't believe he quite got the first down. You see Tommy Marshall, Clay Hendricks, they've done a great job this year of Clay with their offensive line, Tommy with his special teams. Bruce Light gets this punt off, and it's a pretty good one. Punt uh, coverage was good all uh, day. This is a super tackle here by Taylor Quarles. Taylor's been good on all special teams, and we've had a lot of freshmen on those special teams. One of the referees got shaken up. There's a play to hurt us a good bit, a counter option, but we had a bunch of people on this one. Allen Edwards, uh, Kevin Kendrick, Jeff Blankenship, excellent defense. Good stop here by Brian Pitts, Chris Roper, stopping them on short yardage. 
How'd you like playing in the mini dome? It was good surface. I wish uh, East Tennessee would find out what kind of surface they got and get it in their dome. It's the exact dome, but the surface is much different. There's Kevin Kendrick. Good looking at him. Kevin played great and uh, has all year long. This is a good uh, option that we play. You can't say enough about Kelly Fletcher and Wade Sexton and what they did in this game. Wade just fought off that block and made the tackle. Wade made super plays, broke up passes, made the big fumble recovery. And the same kind of option, and you see Kelly Fletcher making a great effort and uh, defensive back meeting the block. And the great thing about it is many of these guys are going to be back next year. There are some of the good Furman fans that were out there and got excited about the game. He's scrambling again, and Sammy Walker has been a backup player behind Paul Craven all year long and played good in this game. Sammy Walker from Greenwood. And they uh, kick another field goal. It's about all they could do against our defense. It's good to get uh, six points, but that's uh, most of what they get against the defense. This is an option. Frankie had a good read on the tackle. Dwight breaks it, and Dwight kept coming back, getting a knee bruised or an ankle or a shoulder, and kept hanging in there. This is a good block by Elton Bailey, good block by Steve Dugan. David Adams makes a good block, Fee Cowan, and we have a nice run. And Dwight Sterling, really uh, a magnificent performance. Then Billy Stockdale gives Dwight a breather, and you really don't lose very much. Billy made some good cuts and has really come on this year. He's a sophomore, just a super young man, and made a good run right there. Good option by Frankie. John makes a good cut. Greg Key makes a block, and we got another good game. Probably should run the option a little bit more. Uh, we got a little conservative there in the fourth quarter, but make it run the option a little bit more. Don Clardy was even blocking downfield there. Don's been a good blocker all year long and been a real steady player. Here's a third and five. Counter option to John, good block by Greg Key, and uh, John breaks a bunch of tackles and we get another first down. And John never stops, does he? He's a very determined runner, probably one of the most determined runners we've ever had at Furman. I think we have a replay of this one coming up. You can see the block by Greg Key, and a uh, good block by our tackle right there, I think it's Tom Griffith. Tom played both tackles, played left and right, he's a freshman. That's not easy to do. Sterling then went for three yards. There's a good look at Greg Key's Greg down. Greg makes a good one. block on there, number 49. You get a good first down. So Dwight gets you close on the next play, and then it's second and goal from the five. That was a big play. Uh, they stunned the linebackers. We had a trap call and end up busting it in the end zone for a touchdown. It was a key to get a touchdown on that drive because we've been stopped so many times. Nine plays, 80 yards. That's super, and Dwight gave you just about everything he had. He had to be helped from the field. They helped him off the field, I think, John Bagger. You can see the trap block right there by David Adam. Look at uh, number 77 right there. That's a four. We call it by Steve Dugan when he puts his man on his back, and that was a super block. See Steve right up in the middle right there, putting that man on his back. And now you're up by a score of 17 to 6. It looked pretty good at this point, but we get that punt block, and there's John and Elton uh, getting the Dwight off the field after he hurt his knee a little bit. Georgia Southern then gets it. This is very late in the third quarter, and you had good kick coverage here. This is a super job right here. They've had some good run back. You can see our coverage right there. Mike uh, Kieran has just been fantastic all year long. Uh, and you can see Wade Sexton in there again and Steve Norris. He's a freshman, and the kick coverage was good. Georgia Southern with the ball. Wade Sexton, Kelly Fletcher, Jeff Blankenship, William Hall. Everyone well, And also Paul Craven. Paul had a good game, made him some big plays. He certainly did. 17 to 6 at the end of three quarters. The fans are going crazy, and Georgia Southern has 15 minutes to get back in this football game. And they came pretty close. Paul Craven right there making the play. Uh, Brian Pitt, 69. Chris Roper, 88. They played fantastic all year long. The big thing is, except for Wayne Burr, we hadn't really lost many of them during the year. We thought this would work one more time, and the guy covered it. We hoped we could hit him with a big one, really take him out of the game. And uh, that guy played it great. Uh, Don does a good job of keeping him from intercepting the ball. You have to come down with possession and, and, and get on the ground. When the ground can cause the fumble, that's not a we fumble. We just didn't execute that good. The outside guy made the hit, and uh, Somebody missed their man up the middle, and Keith Swilling had to take him, and the outside man was free. Keith really should have been able to block the outside man. Somebody in the middle missed their man, but fortunately it didn't cost us a game. So it's 17 to 12. This is a very big play. Big play. Kelly Fletcher uh, forces him to throw, and he forces him to throw it over their heads, and that keeps them from being able to get a field goal to, to win the game or tie the game. So that makes it 17 to 12 in favor of Furman. Again, if they had made the two-point conversion, they'd have been thinking field goal as much as touchdown.
Allen Edwards creates another fumble. He's uh, giving that center fits all day long. I think right in here you can see uh, Dean Williams at nose. He's a little fresher and a little bit quicker than that and makes a super play. About five guys tried to block him. Dean made an unselfish move from first team offensive tackle to second team nose guard and we can't say enough about the kind of move that's been made like that all year long to help us win. Fumble another snap. They fumbled five times and we got the most important one when they were going in and Wade Sexton and a bunch of people got on that fumble in just a second. Another scramble play and a good hit here to uh, keep him from getting the first down. That quarterback got hit quite a few times, Yeah, I think he was a little bit tired at the end of the game, and uh, rightfully should be. There's Here's the, the play right here. This is a big play. Kelly Fletcher makes a hit. Uh, Kevin Kendrick, and look at all those guys on the ball in Wade section. We must have had eight guys around that football. A fantastic fumble recovery right there on your own two-yard line. They this were is very a big close. play right here. Billy Stockdale on a trap, and we get a first down on the very first play. And that's a big play to get us out of that end zone. I hate that to punt down there. Billy had some good runs right in here, some super runs, some good blocks. Uh, this is a good block by David Adams. And Tom Griffin, left tackle, the freshman tackle, made that key block right there, and Billy gets another first down. It was great the way Billy just bounced off that one tackler and just got about five or six more yards. Good spin. You can see it again. That's Tom Griffin making the block, and David Adams, uh, Keith Swilling. Keith makes a big block right there, and Keith had a lot of big plays in this game. You really wouldn't notice. Watch this right here. Keith blocks two of their guys. See those two? Yep. He dives in there with a the head on one, the legs on another, and uh, gets that punt off. And pretty good coverage downfield. Good coverage right there, and we stop them down there from not getting much on the punt return. Now they have to throw. They have to throw, and they play into our hands. The weight almost intercepted that one, and uh, I think they have a fourth down here, and we stop them. And we have to stop them one more time, and we don't make a first down. We probably should have made down there going in. Look at Kelly Fletcher's effort right there trying to get up. Mm. Julius Dixon bats another pass down, but uh, that was fourth down. We got the ball. You did kill about a minute and yeah, got rid of their timeouts. Kill some time right there, and they didn't have any timeouts. And uh, Jeff Blankenship fittingly makes a key interception to take them out of the game. It's first and ten. Georgia Southern are on their own 30. This is their play, and there it is. Jeff is in the right spot at the right time again. He stiff arms their guy down, runs down to the 15-yard line, and I think he tells it all right there. With only 35 seconds to go. Coach, what are you feeling right there? Do you feel you have it now? Well, we, they don't have any timeouts. It's 35 seconds. All we got to do is snap the ball and put it down, and you feel like you know you ought to have a chance to win it. And there's Coach Russell, and there you are. How's it feel to be national champion? It's fantastic for our fans and players and the Furman people and the support we've had this year. It's just fantastic to be able to accomplish something like that. It is the first football national championship ever for Furman University. you got to be oh, ecstatic. Well, there's 200 uh, schools playing Division I football. And there's not but one of them going to win 13 games. I mean, Notre Dame, Miami, West Virginia. There's only one team in Division I that's going to win 13 games, and that's not too bad. Furman, 13-2, and two, nine victories in a row, Southern Conference Championship. And yesterday at Pocatello, Idaho, the Paladins bring home the national championship. Several keys open the door for the national championship. Most notably, the defense which shut down Georgia Southern. And Furman's offensive line, which put the Paladins running game into motion and eventually helped give the national title to Furman. A story is complete of Furman. We got a national championship against Georgia Southern. It's the greatest feeling in the world. Greatest. And I love it. Every minute of it. But you know, we had that sick feeling after 85, that gut feeling, you know, losing the coast game. And so we had something to prove coming out today. And I tell you, it's wonderful. It's incredible. It's the best feeling in the world. Number one. Number one. This is great. This proves that we're the best in the nation. It's just terrific. I tried to do the best I could, and I just got after it. And the whole team did. The whole defense just pulled together and got after it. And that's how we did it. Hey, I kept thinking 85, 85. I thought they were going to come back in the luck in 85. No, baby. We wearing the ring. The gold diamond ring. Gold diamond. But there were some anxious moments before the rings belonged to the Paladins. And Jeff Blankenship's second interception of the night sealed the order. 
they had to pass. A little time left. They wanted. They're working the, the wide side of the field. So you know, we all just went over there, broke on the ball. It was a good play. Pre quarterback had a lot of pressure on him, and just, it all worked like it's supposed to. I bet you don't even think about 85 anymore. Evans, no, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, Coach Jeff Blank and Ship Happy. There's the there's the family portrait. Well, that's a bunch of happy people right there. Nobody works any harder than those stands and those two daughters right there, Sydney and Lee, and they did a fantastic job to, to help win that championship. There's Kenny Goldsmith, a big part of the team. Kenny, uh, he's just a fantastic guy. He wanted to be there as much as anybody, but he uh, did a great job of having spiritual leadership on the sideline, keeping the guys fired up, and there's some of the great fans who are out there, about 325 of them, see the return trip home. Coach, uh, these high fives are getting to be a habit yeah, now after right. Marshall and now after this one. Well, we're a little bit wore out right there. There wasn't a whole lot of enthusiasm in some of that, maybe. All right, a fantastic victory for the Paladins in Idaho last night in the Mini Dome of Pocatello National Championship for Furman University. We'll take a break, and we'll wrap up the season and wrap up the Jimmy Satterfield Show for this week right after this. Well, I'll tell you about those dinners on Friday night. Our players come down here and eat before every home game, and... We eat those prime ribs. I think that probably helped us play better this year. Well, let me tell you, Jimmy, Dwight Sterling told me that the prime ribs were responsible for him winning week in and week out. Just think what that can do for you, Greenville. Buy those two season tickets, order them now, show me the receipt, and we'll give you one free dinner with every ticket, ticket order for two. How about that? The Furman Paladins have won the national championship 17 to 12 last night in Pocatello, Idaho against Georgia Southern. And our producer director Chris Bagwell gives us a musical look now at last night's ball game and at the national champions. We're just about out of time tonight, Coach, but again, a great season and a Super Bowl game last night in Pocatello. Well, this show wouldn't have been possible without people like uh, Dallas Forrest with Nissan and uh, John Gregory Pepsi, NCNB, Bobby Sexton, uh, Billy Turner with Sam White Sportswell, jo uh, John Burgess, and all those people made this show possible. And it's been a super season. In fact, it's been the greatest season of all for Furman University as Furman has won the national championship, and who would have believed it back when we started in September? Thanks a lot for joining us this year on the Jimmy Satterfield Show, and thank you for staying up late with us tonight. And thank you very much for your support. Good night.
champion Furman Paladin. Friday night at 7.30 on your friend Ford. Join Chris Allen, Jim Wogan, and Fred Stepp as they take you through Furman's champion show. Furman's championship season, brought to you by the Furman Company, celebrating 100 years of making Greenville feel like home. By Southeastern Products, dedicated to making you a winner. And by Fleur Daniel, the new symbol of value. One football team in the entire nation is able to make that claim. The national champions, we're number one. And for 1988, that is the Furman Paladins. Coming up in the next half hour, we will get a chance to let you see the entire 1988 season right through to the national championship football game with the Furman Paladins against Georgia Southern in Pocatello, Idaho. All that and more when we return. It will always be known as Furman's championship season. The gentleman from Channel 4 who saw just about every game played for Furman this year was Fred Stepp. Fred, at the beginning of the season, I don't think anybody, including probably the players themselves, expected this team to go as far as a national championship game. Furman, Chris, was projected to finish in the middle of the pack in the Southern Conference. Well, not only do they go on and win the Southern Conference along with Marshall, but they also take the national championship. That, of course, is why we are here. And their whole season from the very start against South Carolina State was just a Cinderella year for the Furman Paladins, and at the beginning of the year, the players, as well as the coaches, were, well, let's say, cautiously optimistic. People don't seem to realize what, that a lot of the guys that are starting right now, uh, like the lone offensive line, for instance, uh, they started at one time or another, and uh, we may be better, we're going to be better than last year's offensive line as the season progresses. If we're going to be a good team, we have to take it one game at a time, and that's all the way you know, through the, the season and hopefully on into the playoffs. It's going to be one game at a time. It's just like walking upstairs. That's exactly what Furman did, starting with South Carolina State on September 3rd. Bobby Doherty scored his first touchdown of the year on a 22-yard run. Patrick Baines quarterbacked the Talons to their first win, throwing to Greg Key for the touchdown as Furman rolled over the Bulldogs 38 to nothing. The Paladins experienced their first road trip and their first loss the next week against Clemson. The Tigers simply overpowered a much smaller Furman team, but the Paladins proved, hey, little guys can hit. Sherrod Weber drilled Terry Allen for the Hit of the Year award, but Furman never established an offense and fell to 1-1 one one after losing 23-3. They rebounded, however, and took off on a three-game winning streak, starting with a 21-zip crushing of Presbyterian. Sophomore quarterback Frankie DeBus got his first start of the year against Newberry on September 24th. DeBus led the Paladins to a 42-0 victory. His performance that afternoon earned him a starting berth he would keep the rest of the season. Defensively, attention centered on the fact that Furman had not allowed another team to score at Paladin Stadium. The charge was led by Jeff Blankenship. We're just playing team defense, and you know we have 11 people coming to the ball, and we're not relying on one person to make the play. So it's basically just everybody chipping in together. Yeah, it's everyone doing their job and playing their responsibility, and you know when that happens, the defense is going to shut down an offense. On October 8th, Furman started their conference schedule with a scare from VMI. The Cadets took advantage of a sloppy Furman offense and jumped out to a 13-0 lead. At this point, Furman learned how to come from behind. Dwight Sterling took it in to close the gap to six. Then, Frankie DeBus showed he could run as well as throw, going nine yards to give Furman a one-point lead. Bobby Doherty capped the game by going 43 yards for the touchdown and the Paladins won their first conference game, 31-13. At 4-1, Furman took to the road for the second time to take on Marshall. October 8th would prove to be their worst outing of the year, despite a 59-yard touchdown run by Kenneth Goldsmith. The thundering herd picked the Paladin defense apart and scored more points on Furman than any other team. 
FSU lost their second contest of the season, 24 to 10. By now, the question was, can Furman win on the road? Well, they showed us all they could against Appalachian State. Dwight Sterling led the way by scoring two touchdowns, and the Buck added more excitement as the Paladins improved to five and two and two and one by beating App State 24 to nine. Western Carolina was also ineffective against the Paladins. Frankie DeBusk had an exceptional game as well as the defense. Furman routed the Catamounts 31 to nothing. UT Chattanooga was a tougher battle for Furman and a muddier one as well. Chris Roper gets the interception here and the Paladins won 10 to seven, climbing their way up to the national polls at seven and two. The victory at East Tennessee State was a little easier. Frankie DeBus hit Greg Key for the touchdown. Then John Bagwell ran for another. Final score, 31 to 14. At eight and two and five and one in the conference, the Paladins had just one obstacle to overcome for a share of the conference title, the Citadel. On November 19th, the Bulldogs came to Greenville and were stymied. The bus had another big afternoon and Furman accomplished one of their season goals, a Southern Conference Championship, plus a 30 to 17 win over the Citadel. Did a super job winning the game against their excellent football team. Is this a great game for South Carolina, the Southern Conference, and football in this area? We knew we were going to have a potent uh, offensive attack, you know, when they did get up 7 0, but, you know, we stuck together. That's, what this, that's why we win as a team. We play as a team. We love one another. We play as a team. That's the reason we won that ring this, this day right here. With a regular season record of 9 and 2, postseason play began with Delaware at a rowdy Paladin Stadium. Up seven to nothing, Frankie DeBus found Greg Key for 19 yards. Then, Glenn Connolly booted three points for a 10 to nothing lead. The Paladin defense had its share of excitement, like Kevin Kendrick's interception. Then, John Bagwell put the nail in the coffin with a 63 yard run and a fourth and one touchdown as Furman advanced to the playoffs 21 to seven. I don't guess it's as exciting as beating the Fiddle last week, but you know, we're one step closer to what we've all hoped and dreamed for starting the tour days, and that's our goal right now. Next stop was back to Marshall for the grudge match of the year, and what a game it was. Both teams had extremely big plays, like this one from the bus all the way to George Quarles. Marshall had its share of thrills as well, like this touchdown pass from John Gregory to Mike Barber, but Furman would still win the thriller 13-9. Then, on December 10th, only four teams were alive in the playoff. Furman and Idaho were two, but the Paladins went all out for this one. Bobby Doherty got the pitch, and there was no looking back. 38 to seven was the final, and the Furman Paladins were going to Pocatello, Idaho for the national championship. of the 15 games played this year by the Furman Paladins. The one game we have not seen is the national championship game. And I know, Jim, you were one of the guys who got off the plane there in that five-degree weather to see the rematch of the national championship from 1985. That's right, and I'm not so sure the 85 situation, the rematch situation, wasn't played up just a bit too much. There were only four players from that team playing this year. A couple of the coaches were the same, but I guess the big thing, the fans were the same. They remember that situation all too well. One of the humorous things that happened in Pocatello, some of the locals were asking this as we got off the plane, what's a paladin? Well, the answer came Saturday night because a paladin simply is a national champion. Ironically, Furman's win over Idaho led the paladins back to the Vandals' home state. After a four-hour flight, Furman fans were welcomed by a Pocatello warming committee. Good thing, because a stiff Idaho wind chill registered near zero degrees. Fortunately, the big game would be played inside. The Paladins got their first chance to practice in Idaho on Thursday, about two hours worth. For seniors Jeff Blankenship and John Bagwell, it was their second shot at playing for a national championship. It's a good feeling. You know, I'm just happy to be back here. I'm happy to go out on a note that I came in on. And, you know, like I said earlier, hopefully I can, you know, take it one step farther with the national championship. It's such a great opportunity to have one, to be able to play for a national championship. And to play for two of them, I mean, you know, it's just beyond belief. Sometimes I just sit and think about it and say, man, I can't believe we're here again. But uh, like Jeff said before, you know, I hope there's one more step. Payback uh, is a great incentive. And I think they, they have that in their favor. 
Irk Russell could pass for a professional wrestler, but Georgia Southern's head coach had his team playing with pro-like efficiency. It was their third national championship game. And yes, they brought some of that infamous Eagle Creek water from back home to bless the field. Well, that's part of the ritual is not telling you when the ritual is going to take place. <laughs> Russell can master a one-liner, but fans would have to master two days in Idaho before the big game even arrived. Pocatello is tucked into southeast Idaho. Big sky country, two and a half hours from Salt Lake City, two hours from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Basically, a long way from most places, including home. For Furman fans who made the trip, the big game was still two days away, and they were dealing with big differences, like being two hours behind Greenville in time and about 30 degrees in temperature. I think I was expecting us to be within walking distance of maybe some civilization, and we're not really. We're kind of isolated here. I'm going to do it. I don't know how it's all been to realize it. On that first night, it was five degrees below zero, but the days warmed in the mid-20s. The 350 Furman fans who made the 2,000-mile trip occupied their time with sightseeing and festivities. Pocatello threw out Southern-like hospitality for two Southern teams playing for the national championship. Well, it's much colder than it is at home. I believe the temperature last night was, I believe they said it was something like five degrees below zero wind chill. But we're having a wonderful time. This is a beautiful city, and the people are treating us wonderful here. Finally, the wait was over. After killing time for two and a half days, the Paladins finally had their game face on, and a tough one at that. Talk all week was about the running game, but on their first play from scrimmage, Furman went sky high. Quarterback Frank DeBuff to receiver Don Lipscomb. There was no touchdown to follow, but that completion set the tone. We didn't score, but it sort of set the momentum in our favor and kind of put them down a little bit, but they still hung, hung in there strong. Next time around, it pays off. With John Bagwell and Dwight Sterling chewing up Georgia Southern inside, DeBus hit two more big passes, then found tight end Greg Key for the touchdown. Furman led 7-3. to three. He was just kind of throwing it away. He said, I thought the guy was going to bump you and run with you. And he said, I was going to lay it up there, and I just ran under. The defense was tough all night. Quarterback Raymond Gross had to run for his life, completed just five passes, and generated less than 200 yards total offense. It's, it's just, you know, team defense. Uh, somebody was putting pressure on the passer. He had to scramble, and it's like we've been doing all season playing as a team. Second half, Furman wasn't quite as productive through the air, but got the job done down low. The Paladins used nearly five minutes, went 80 yards on nine plays, Dwight Sterling capped it off with a touchdown. Furman led 17 to 6. Well, I was trying to run, but my ankle just, it wasn't working, so I got on about the two, so I just hopped and tried to make it to the end zone. Talk on this team was destiny, but things began to look like deja vu. After leading by 11 with 15 minutes to play, Georgia Southern blocked a punt, ran it in for a touchdown, and cut the Furman lead to 5. I think that was in the back of everyone's mind. But uh, we try to block that out and just tell ourselves that we need to go out and uh, keep doing the job that we've been doing. Well, you ain't got time to think about 85. You better take care of 88. And we're just trying to think of what was the best thing to do. Kick a field goal at the end or go for it. And uh, luckily, we did what was enough to win the game. Then another GSU drive, but Wade Sexton was in the right place at precisely the right time. I saw the ball pop out, and, and I wanted so bad to get to it, but I couldn't. I was running through people, and I saw Wade jump on it, and it, oh, it was just relief just went through my body. Georgia Southern got the ball back one more time with a minute 30 to play, but senior linebacker Jeff Blankenship grabbed his second interception that night, and the Paladins were national champs. Well, it's just a fantastic effort. I can't say enough about these coaches and players. They've done everything to ask of them, and they truly deserve what they got. Number one. Of 85, I was at home watching. I couldn't do anything about it. I was on the traveling team, but this time, I was one of the starters, and it's a whole different thing. Right now, I'm going to celebrate this victory, and hopefully next year, we can do the same thing. Players celebrated that night, and after a 2,000-mile flight back home, shared the feeling with Furman fans who turned out at Greenville Spartanburg Airport. Number one in the nation, not number two, not number three, not number one in the state of South Carolina, but number one in the nation. And don't you forget. Number one. That's real. That's great. I tell you, nothing else.
championship season has brought a lot of pride to the Furman campus. There is one gentleman on the Furman campus who is probably the proudest, and he is the head cheerleader, also known as the president of Furman University, Dr. John John. When the Furman Paladins take to the field, they can always count on support from the Furman community. Like every other school, they have a mascot, cheerleaders, and enthusiastic fans. But you'd have to look pretty hard to find another university president who spurs on his school like Furman President Dr. John John. Both Dr. John's and his wife Martha are Furman graduates. They returned to their alma mater in 1976 for John's to take the post as president. It wasn't long after that that John's took someone up on a dare and led the student section with his now famous and traditional F.U. cheer. It is, uh, I think, something that brings the, the student body together. It, 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 I never go down to uh, leave any street that uh, I'm not invited. And uh, it uh, has gotten to be now rather a routine thing at some time near the end of the third quarter, the student body, the cheerleaders, the uh, band members start a chant, uh, inviting me to come down and lead the cheer. And these days, his chest swells with just a little more pride, knowing that the Paladins have proven you can reach the pinnacle of athletic success, playing by the rules and not sacrificing academics. In an atmosphere like that, who can blame the man for wanting to give a little yell? Right now, we have a lot of fun. And uh, I enjoy uh, being a part of the, of the uh, well, I'm going to say the general atmosphere of, of a Furman game. Dr. Johns is obviously the number one fan at Furman University, but the man who is in charge of what makes everything work with the football end of it is Jimmy Satterfield. And Jimmy has been kind enough to invite us into his home today so that we get a chance to talk to him about this championship season. First thing that I'd like to ask you, Coach, is watching that game on television after it's over, your face didn't show any emotion any differently than maybe we've seen you throughout the rest of the season. Did it just not sink in yet, or what was going on at that time? Uh, several people have asked me that. I don't really know, but the, you get so wrapped up in the game, thinking about plays and so forth, I think the game was over, and I didn't uh, really know what it, it all had been about. But uh, I think it sunk in now, and it's a fantastic feeling. What about the emotional end of it? Uh, you, evidently, when we watch you on the field, you seem to be a lot of X's and O's and maybe not get into the emotion at that time. Have you had a chance to experience that part of it now and let loose a little bit? Yeah, I think so. That a lot of people have called and the town's being painted purple and everybody's excited about Furman and we're excited and I think during the game sometimes you get so wrapped up in the game thinking about plays that you don't want to get too emotional because you won't be able to do the job. You're in a situation where you've been the head coach for three years now and I think a lot of people have had the perspective out in the public at least is that uh, you're following a man who was very successful, took the team there in 1985 talking about Dick Sheridan and now Jimmy Satterfield is here, and maybe you weren't getting a lot of the respect or notoriety out there that maybe was deserved. And now you have finally made that name for yourself and then some by winning the national championship. What are your thoughts on maybe a somewhat delicate situation there, at least in the perspective of, of viewers? Well, I think maybe that might have been the perspective of a lot of people. I never really worried about it. Of course, I was at Eau Claire High School, and I took over one time as a head coach. It was a very successful program. Steve Robson, Art Baker had been there, and we played for the state championship in 70, and we won 11 games the year I took over. So it wasn't something new for me, but a lot of people didn't realize that. And of course, we were 7-3-2 and three and two the first year. We were just barely away from having a great team, and having guys like Bobby Johnson, a lot of these assistant coaches, it didn't worry me too much about taking over. What about this particular team as far as maybe describing their personality versus other teams you have dealt with and how that might tie in with how far they went this year? Well, I think they're very similar to a lot of teams we've had at Furman. We may have had a little bit more luck than some other teams have had. Teams we've had at Furman have had a lot of heart. They have a lot of character. They play hard. They give you everything they have. This team was an ultimate in that area. They, 
Oh, each week we very seldom had a down week. They played up when we played PC. We played up when we played uh, East Tennessee State, one, not one of the better teams in our conference this year. They played great at Clemson. They played great at uh, Appalachian. They played great at Marshall. So I think they got a lot of similar characteristics. They may have carried just a little bit further. Recruiting is a big thing in your business. Have you felt anything on what this might do for you now after winning a national championship? Well, we've been calling a bunch of recruits since we got back. I called a bunch of them last night, and each time I call one, they're excited about Furman. They're talking about our national championship. They're talking about watching us on TV, and I don't see that team do anything but help us. Eric Russell said after the game that he felt maybe the low he felt then was lower than the highs were high when he won the national championship. You've not had to lose it, I guess, but uh, is there maybe some credence to that thought? Well, it shouldn't be that way. You ought to have highs when you win, but as a coach, you worry about things so much. You want them to do well for your players and fans and so forth. I think the lows are lower, but uh, you, you hope that they wouldn't be that way, but it just seems to be human nature that that's the way it works. Thank you very much for inviting us into your home here, and congratulations on a fantastic season. Thank you. National champions. This is the hardware, the proof. This is the trophy that Furman brought back with them from Pocatello, Idaho, after defeating Georgia Southern in the national championship game. But more than the hardware, it's the emotions that the players, the coaches, and even the fans will be able to take with them through the rest of their lives. Thanks for joining us in Furman's championship season. <laughs>